What's up, sports fam? What's going on? It's Big Q. You're rocking with the sports coma with Big Q and the guys. And we have intense, entertaining, educating, and enlightening sport talk from your favorite sports family. I'm in the building with you, Big Q. This is the second number two on the sports coma live streams. And I like to say, man, it's a terrific honor to be in the building with the Saints Black and Gold Nation, man. I just got to tell you, it's a terrific honor to be here. And uh, in today's podcast, man, what I want to talk to y'all about is uh, a number of topics dealing with the New Orleans Saints. Now, this is a live stream. It's a two-hour live stream we're doing today. So feel free to chat, hit the chat. If you got questions, concerns, or comments, you can also feel free to give us a call on our call-in number that's in the chat, 504-475-4482. But it's a number of topics that I want to go over today here on the Sports Coma live stream. And, um, you know, let's get right into it. Like I said, two-hour live stream, fam. We got going to you on this beautiful Saturday. And we're going to talk about some black and gold talk, man. Let's How, how about it? You know, let's have it out with some black and gold talk. And I got a few topics I want to bring up with you guys today. Um, the Saints recently signed wide receiver Rashad Matthews, former Jet, former Titan, wide receiver known for running very crisp routes. Uh, the Saints, they brought this guy aboard, man. And when I was looking at him, when I seen the Saints invited them to try out at the mini camp, you know, it wasn't a surprise. I knew they were bringing a veteran. We said it prior to it actually happening. If you go back and listen to the podcast, I said, I don't think the Saints are done yet bringing in wide receivers. I'm just going to be honest with you. They're not ready. They're not done. You know, Cameron Meredith's injury situation is something that's been uh, lingering over the last several seasons. It's just is it just wasn't good. Then you had the, the uncertainty with Traquan Smith, you know, what, what his second year looked like. Although I think Traquan Smith turned out to be a pretty decent wide receiver. All he has to do is hang out with that guy, Michael Thomas. That's all. Learn, just emulate whatever he does. Can't, you know, you got an example of greatness right over there. Hang out with him, Traquan. But I expect big things from Traquan Smith because the level of why in the wide receiver room is Mike Thomas way up here and everybody looking up there like, man, we got to get up there to where Mike Thomas is. So we got to emulate him. But the question that is that I have on my mind is Rashard Matthews versus Cam Ryan Meredith. Who's the winner in that situation? Welcome aboard peeps. I thank y'all for joining to the sports comb. Appreciate the thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. Please hit the notification and the thumbs up button. To get more con- to more people to uh, the sports coma live stream, but if you're a Saints faithful, and I know many of you are, Rashad Matthews and Cameron Meredith seems to be the thing that I'm more concerned with. You know, in terms of wide receiver, which one of those guys win? You know, and let's say for instance, if Cameron Meredith and Rashad Matthews. Is it possible that they both make the team? You know, is it possible? I mean, I don't know about that one, man. I don't I don't think both of them make the team, but you might have a different opinion. You might figure, yeah, Q, I think they can. Then again, I don't know. I don't think so. I think uh, Rashad Matthews is trying to take what Cameron Meredith think he has. Versus everyone else as well. Because, you know, Trey Quine Matthew, if you're going to talk about Rashad Matthews and Cam Ryan Meredith, which is an interesting battle between veterans, you know, you got to throw in the young guys like Keith Kirkwood that's vying for the slot position. Austin Carr, who's still on the team. A lot of people <laughs> got mixed feelings about old Austin and other guys. So also today on the show, I want to talk about the who's the best pass rushing option behind the uh, Davenport and the mighty Cam Jordan. Who's the best pass rushing option? Is it Wes Horton? Is it Wes, y'all? Really? I don't know about that. Could it be Carl Granderson, perhaps? He's facing those charges. And there are other guys who want to lay mention to, but you know, who's the best pass rushing option behind Davenport? Let's, you know, just in case we need 
guys, when those two guys, Jordan and Davenport, get tired, need a few reps off, who's going to come in and keep the, the pressure on the quarterback? You know, who's that third guy? Trey Hendrickson? You know, you see what I'm getting at? It's very uncertain at that pad, that third pass rush position, but we're going to talk about it today in the two-hour live stream. Also, what's the insurance, y'all, behind Teron Armstead? You know, we played Armstead yesterday on the podcast saying that he feels better than he ever had, but I've heard that before from Teron Armstead. I've, I'm not kidding you. I've heard that. You know, starting the season off healthy is really good if you're a big offensive lineman like Teron. But is it possible, you know, that we have a viable tackle behind him that's not named Andrews Pete? Do we? And these are questions as a Saint faithful, man, we got to ask. Because, you know, sooner or later, I hate to say it, and I'm not trying to cast stones on nobody or wish ill of nobody, because to wish ill on one would be simply uh, detrimental to oneself. What up, who that chubs, 504, any Pelicans talk? Yeah, we can talk Pelicans, my friend. You know, we can talk whatever, talk about this a two-hour live stream. We're talking most of the same stuff, but feel free, man. We can talk some Pelicans. We can talk some Pelicans today. I did a live stream on the New Orleans. On the, I don't know if you're on, if you, uh, maybe you should, like if you're on YouTube, Chubbs, go, or you can put in a YouTube search uh, box, the Pelican Post Game Report. That's another one of our channels. Subscribe to that. We, because I did a live stream yesterday covering whether I think AD was going to go. And later on today, We'll do one talking about the second round picks and who we feel are viable. I know my dog DJ out there wanted to hear that. We did a live stream, um, an audio podcast yesterday on Spreaker, you know, covering a lot of Pelican news and insight. But there is one. We, we did talk Pelicans on a live stream yesterday. It's on the Pelican Post Game Report channel. Thank you, sir. I, I see you say you just described. Thank you, friend. Appreciate it. And the live streams on there. And uh, like I said, we also have a podcast that we do on the Pelican Post Game Report as well. So I appreciate you for subscribing and following the contact. So, yeah, we're talking Saints right now, but feel free if you want Pelican talk. We can switch and get to that Pelican, go back to the Saints, go back to the Pelicans, go back to the Saints. We are multifaceted here, fam. We can do it all, man. You know, I put my Saints hat on. I get my Saints brain on. But remember, the Saints and Pelicans are the same family. So... <laughs> It's the same hat, man. <laughs> but anyway, we're going to talk about other talk as well, man. Uh, QB talk of the future. Do we have, do we have, I see your friend. Do we have the quarterback of the future on the team? Do we have that guy? Is that guy on the team? You know, we got Teddy Bridgewater who giving what, $17 million to? We got Taysom Hill who ain't giving nothing to. Well, I ain't going to say nothing, but. You know, he ain't making that much. He really earning his bread. But a lot of people, Ver, Verlin, Verlin Casey asked me that question. Big shout out to you, Verlin. He asked me that question a couple of days ago about why isn't anybody taking Taysom Hill serious to back up to become the quarterback behind Drew Brees? I mean, he would be one of the most exciting quarterbacks. I just think Taysom has to decide on, you know, he to be more of a passer. You know, he's quick to take off. You got to scan that field better and take advantage of the time in the QB room with Drew Brees, even though the time in the QB room with Drew Brees is very limited because he's constantly in the special teams room because they got him doing all kinds of stuff. So, you know, we're going to ask that question to the Saints faithful. We'll try to get that to the best of our ability. And of course, with the signing of Kayvon Webster, the Saints new defensive back, what does he bring to the team fam? What does he bring? Is he a guy that's just going to sit back at the fourth string cornerback position? Because P.J. Williams, he's got to be on his toes. From what I was seeing at camp, P.J. Williams is trying to step it up here. Only because he knows he's feeling this. This is going to be his last hurrah with the team. He's facing uh, – He has a. this is a, a final year. He's one year left on his contract, a one-year deal he just signed with the team. And the fact that um, the, the, the notice is out on P.J. Either show up or get ghosts. And if you you then we got to throw what chance of Gardner Johnson in the mixture. He's gonna be playing a lot of the tree position. You know what, what? What do you think about that? You know, so that's some of the topics we're gonna talk about today. Um, to get right in it now, Rashad Matthews to get right to the Rashad Matthews versus Cameron Meredith news. Now Cam 
I was really excited to get Cameron Meredith. And I love his size and his ability. The guy can catch the freaking ball as well. And then the Saints said, oh, man, we got to deal. We got to deal with the fact that Cameron Meredith is not available, fam. He's not available. You know, so what, what is that all about? The fact that Cameron Meredith is not available. He can't get on the field. He did, the mini camp went on and he practiced mostly all field on the side with a trainer. You know, it's been tough for Cameron Meredith, to say the least, to get on the field. Saints felt like, man, Rashad Matthews, we're going to sign Rashad Matthews to a deal, one-year deal. The details have not been disclosed. I did several searches on it this morning to try to find any contracts. But basically, the word on the street is it's just a one-year deal. Um, you know, and that's what we're talking about here. Uh, but who that Chubb say, to be honest, we don't know. We have to see how Teddy B and Taysom do in camp and the preseason. We're going to see who's be be fitted the most from the extra year in Peyton system. That's true, friend. Wise words, too. Very wise words. Hey, Crass, big ups to Crass joining the conversation. Uh, what did I miss? You didn't miss too much, uh, fam. We're just breaking down the topics today. We're going to talk about Rashad uh, Matthews versus Cameron Meredith versus everyone else. Uh, who's the best third option behind, Carl, uh, behind the Davenport and Cam Jordan starting defensive end combination who's our third option to keep the pass rush going uh insurance in case teron armstead get hurt who is the best tackle behind him who do we have besides andrews pete because you know that's pretty much sean payton go-to move teron goes out pete slides all the way to left tackle and then we got people out here saying man pete garbage pete's terrible he's awful well how the hell he's supposed to learn his job if he got to do that guy's job you know I know y'all guys went to work, had a job where well, you went to work and then you had to do something extra. Maybe some of y'all didn't, but you had to do something extra because that guy over there didn't do his job well. So you had to go over there and pick up his stuff. That's pretty much what Andrews is doing. Andrews has played three positions since he's been here. Now, Taron Armstead, when he started, he started off at the right. Then they say, nope, let's move him to the left because he's fast. He was the fastest offensive lineman in the draft when the Saints picked him up out of Arkansas Pine Bluff, I think, is it? If I got my Saints brain on correctly. But this is the things that we're dealing with. You know, if Andrews Pete, and this is something I said on the prior, the previous live stream and other podcasts, is that if Andrews Pete was allowed to just simply play his spot, which remember also, let me throw this in there, Andrews Pete was an offensive tackle coming out of Stanford. He was a tackle. Then the, when the Saints came in, he they he played a little tackle. Then the Saints said, you know what, we need him at. Let's see if he can play guard. They put him at left guard, then right guard. And remember, Andrews Pete and, and Sean Payton didn't have patience with this guy. He was just like, oh, he's not picking it up fast enough. Man, what are you, are you crazy? The man trying to learn three positions. And then when in, in the betweens, him learning the left and the right guard, which is two different positions. It's called the guard, but right guard and left guard had two different uh, a feelings to him you know it's it's a different it's different he learned how to play both positions became a pretty damn good left guard by the way and then right when he was getting good armstead goes down kick him out the left tackle kick him you remember and then who did they put that left guard in his place calamente big ups to calamente man he, he listens to the show houston texans man big ups to him he got a fat contract with houston big ups to him so that's some of the things we're talking about there, my friend Crass, who, you know, and of course the QB of the future situation. Uh, is, do we have the QB of, of the future on the team currently? Is it Drew Brees? I mean, excuse me, Drew Brees' successor? Is it Teddy Bridgewater, the $17 million man, or perhaps Taysom Hill, the $200,000, $300,000 man? I, I don't know what Taysom Hill makes, but I guarantee it ain't much. Ain't much for a professional football team. Who that, Travess? Travis Wharton is in the building, man. Who that to you, fam? Welcome to joining. Y'all shout out everybody in the live stream, man. Shout out, man. Shout out where you from. Let me hear from you, man. Let me hear from you. Where y'all guys are chatting from? You know, chat. Uh, a shout out. What's going on, fam? Let us know where you're coming from. Also, and then we talk about k and Webster. I don't want to let him slide past us either, fam, because um, Crash said Taysom Hill. No, sir. <laughs> what's up douglas robinson jr who that for life what's happening my friend welcome to the the live stream you know thank you for coming in brother um chris let me tell you something friend 
No, sir. Take some seriously. You know, come on. Now, add this into your thought process, too. Remember what Sean Payton said about Taysom Hill. Do you remember what he said when they asked him about him potentially being a quarterback successor to Drew Brees? Do you remember what he said, Crass? What did he say? What did he say, friend? He said, in reference to the Taysom Hill situation, that the QB is in the building. Remember that? That's what your, that's what your coach said. That's what your coach said. The QB is in the building in reference to Taysom Hill. So. <laughs> uh, Chris said, he's a gadget guy. Sean was telling a lie. <laughs> you know what, Chris? Man, uh, Sean lies a lot, man. I ain't going to lie to you. My coach lied. He a liar's ass off, man. I don't know if he was lying about Taysom, but he is a gadget guy. But, you know, it might work. If you learn behind Drew, it could possibly work. But anyway, that's some of the discussions that we was having getting into it, friends. So let's focus our thoughts on this, and y'all guys can feel free to chime in. Everybody on the live stream, you know, hit the chat, man. Tell me where y'all calling from. Introduce yourself. Uh, I want to talk to y'all, man, about some of these topics. I want to pick y'all brains. Let's have a good old Saints discussion here. Share the live stream. Send the links out to all our sports, uh, all of our Saints family out there, the Who That Nation, the Black and Gold crew, the um, – what's the other great ones out there that I love to uh, talk to? Oh, the Black and Gold Mafia. Everybody, man, let's go. Let's talk some Saints for the next couple of hours here. Now, I want to put out, put out to y'all, don't sleep on Teddy B. He could be the guy after Drew. No, I'm not going to sleep on Teddy B. Crass. I'm not sleeping on him. I know who that man is. I know exactly who he is. I know exactly what he can do. He just needs to, I mean, I don't know. He just don't look the same between what he was in Minnesota and today. You know, he just, I don't know. It's just not the same, you know. Like with that Carolina outing, I know it was one game, but jeez, he just looked it like junk in that game and i was like after the first quarter or two i was like man put Taysom Hill in there at least we'll get some excitement but he was like 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 a bowl of bland beans or something i mean it was just like how you have all these ingredients out here and you you stinking to join up like this i mean you just throw the ball to mike thomas all game and make things happen just didn't look right i know there's more in the way he's gonna gain he's gonna get better we're gonna see what's going on with him let me ask y'all, guys, start with the topics here, man. Rashad Matthews versus Cameron Meredith. And like I said, feel free. This is a live chat, man. Feel free to hit the chat. Questions, concerns, or comments. Uh, the call-in number is in the chat as well. You can feel free to call in 504-475-4482 or simply hit the chat up. Rashad Matthews versus Cameron Meredith. Like I said, who, who wins that here? Who wins that? Which one of these guys we keep? Now, I heard mixed... Uh, reviews from different people about Cameron Meredith and about uh, Rashad Matthews or whether or not who's going to be the guy. But let me just sprinkle this one on you. The Saints wouldn't have went out and tried out this man and signed him if they didn't felt for a second that he was going to be something that they could use. Because Cameron Meredith, I think, remember last year, the Saints would have cut Cameron Meredith. Put this in your Saints brains too, fam. Remember last year, they were going to release Cameron Meredith if he hadn't taken that pay cut. He took a pay cut last year to remain with the team. Remember that. He took a pay cut. And he hasn't done too much of anything since he's been down here because he can't see the field. That's why we have a Rashad Matthews. So what's the thought process here? Who wins that battle? Do we, you know? Do this right? Because I'm going to tell you something. Did any of you guys, I know you guys watch footage on Rashad Matthews. I went out and found some film and studied some film on Rashad Matthews, and I was quite impressed. They said he ain't got much speed, but let me tell you something. What I seen from him, he have a burst. You might not tear up the track when he run, but I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, Rashad Matthews uh, is, is a pretty nice receiver now he's very not very big i mean he's six feet but 217 pounds closer to 220 but he's solid so rashad matthews and cameron meredith versus everybody else and i say everybody else meaning who else can man that slot keith kirkwood i don't think traquan smith is a slot man that's my opinion they're trying to make him into that because he had third round selection but he's not a slot man to me 
I would say Austin Carr is the slot is a nice slot compliment if he can make it to get the snaps. Keith Kirkwood they impressed with him uh, because of his size and his ability. He, he's really comfortable in the Saints offense. And then you have other wide receivers behind him that I don't know if they'll get a fair shake at it. You got Emmanuel Butler we talked about, LeJordan Humphreys. There's a lot of LeJordan Humphrey guys out there. Um, Deontay Harris, who's yet to see the field. Everybody's waiting to see what he can do. How about Sammy Cobbs Jr., who they picked up from the Tampa Bay practice squad? And, of course, another wide receiver the Saints picked up before they picked up Rashad Matthews was Chad Hansen, who didn't get much uh, fanfare. What does that mean? What the hell does that mean? What is Chad Hansen going to give you? You know, how about that? The Saints signed that man, and they also signed Rashad Matthews, two wide receivers within a short time span. What does Chad Hansen give you? You know, I looked up some stuff on Chad Hansen. He's not a super quick receiver, but he's real shifty. He can catch the ball, pretty average receiver. But what does Chad Hansen give you? You know, these is this is the wide receiver room for the New Orleans Saints for 2019 going into the big camp, mini camp over with, fam. The next move is, you know, we're going to get to some bigger things and put some pads on these guys and see what they look like with the shoulder pads on and everything else like that there. Kraft says, I don't think Meredith's knee will ever be right again. He was killing it in the slot in Chicago pre-injury. That's true. And you know what, too? Uh, even if he can make it back from injury, it's the psychological aspect of it, too. You know, it's like what Teddy Bridgewater's had to get over when he had microfracture surgery on his knee. I mean, that was that was a nasty injury, man. And one of the things you got to do is you got to get over the psychological air, the planting and throwing, and you got people scurrying around your feet, guys falling around your feet. You know, it's like, oh, my, I won't get hurt again. <laughs> but $17 million, he can have some bionic legs built. Don't worry about that, Bridgewater. Just just handle your business. That's That's what I'm saying, sir. Handle your business. But, yes, I agree with you. Uh, he was looking really good in that Chicago office. I think Chicago knew something because you don't let a 6'3", a 6'4", 220-pound wide receiver in a slot go. You know, and the guy attacking the ball at his highest point, you don't let a guy like that walk, you know, to another team in the NFC unless you knew you had the doctor's report, you know. You know, he had the doctor's report, fam. He was like, just like Cameron Meredith is not going to be able to contribute like we want him to. You know, we're going to have to release him. You show, you show, coach. Yeah, we're going to have to release him. According to the doctor's report, he's not going to be able to contribute the way we want to. Well, go ahead on and release him. So the Saints pick him up. Their doctors pass him and say, yeah, he's good to go. Sign him to a contract. And that's been something that we've been dealing with uh, properly vatting these guys physically getting the right guys. And I've clowned the Saints organization about that before, you know, you know, about the health staff and how they, the, how the, how you doctors looking at these guys and then they're not totally healthy and you bring them in here. Oh, sign them. He just got a little something in his knee. But if you sign him right now, he'd be healthy in about a month or two and then he'll give you an all-star year, pro bowl year, whatever's going on. I won't sign no player, man. I'm not signing any player. If he's not healthy, if he can't go on the field, do a trial. He can't do the trial right. And then you got all that stuff, background records to check them out. It's like what happened with uh, Big Boy, the defensive tackle from Al from Arbin. His name escapes me right now. Isn't that a shame? Y'all chime out. What's up, uh, Daymanic? Is I'm saying that right? Daymanic? Daymanic? Says he loved the show. Thank you, my friend. Thank you and welcome. Welcome to the show. Welcome. I think a lot of the stuff that's going on right now with the wide receiver room is, is just a part of the a game. Rashad Matthews is obviously here because Farley, that's right, Crash. Thank you, friend. Farley, you know, big Nick Farley. You know, how did they miss that? It's his heart. You know, if this don't work, he did. I mean, how do you not know that the man had heart troubles? I mean, you, you're a billion dollars. This, the Saints worth the, over a billion dollars. Y'all know that? I'm pretty sure y'all do. Y'all smart as hell, man. 
you realize that the Saints organization is worth over a billion dollars. They got doctors that work exclusively for the Saints. It ain't like I got to go to Ashton and say, hey, doc, when you finish with that uh, pedestrian surgery over there, could you come over here to the sports side and work on this man over here? No, it don't work like that. They have their own doctors employed, and then if they need special work done, then they'll have special surgeons that do just work with athletes that you go to and they'll send them over here and they send them over here. They got certain ones. They don't go to everybody, but there's a trusted list of people that they will deal with. You know, it's not like they're using somebody else's doctors. They ain't going to Ashton and say, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and the man sitting in the, in the, in the, in the, in a waiting room <laughs> with his hand on his heart, leaning over. It don't work like that, man. How did they miss that? That was one of the questions I was pro proposing to them then. You know, I catch stuff like that. You know, it's crazy. But this is the deal. Could this be another situation like that? How did y'all pay? How, how did the man hasn't done anything? I mean, he caught a couple passes. I think he had one touchdown and he kind of looked like he was on the trail. I was hoping like, man, come on, pick it up, pick it up. He was just like jogging to the, t the end zone. Man was running them down. Yeah, yeah, Crass is hitting it. Saints have been gambling on guys who have burned us. Bird, oh, man, you depressing the whole show, Crash. You bringing us all down with these names. Oh, my goodness, that's a terrible list. Jarius Bird, we want to forget him. Kobe fleeing, the, oh, my goodness, what, what horribleness is that? Now, Nick Fairley, not so bad, you know, but that came after the fact. Kakaha, terrible. 19 sacks in Washington that year when he played for the Huskies. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 19 sacks at the University of Washington. Second round draft pick. Hello, he Kakaha. And I'm thinking, man, this guy is going to come in here. He got 19 sacks. He led college that year with sacks, 19 of them. I said, well, 19 sacks, that's not too many people get that done. He got a niche for it. Came in here, what happened? Saints didn't use him right. You had Rob Ryan running the defense, running the three full. Rob Ryan tearing up shit. Tearing it up. Had the man dropping back in the coverage. I'm like, Rob, what are you doing? That man dropping in the coverage? Kakaha? No. You're sending him the wrong way, partner. He's supposed to go forward. He's not supposed to go back looking to try to knock a pass down. That's not what Kakaha do. You just lunch his ass at the quarterback every chance that you get. That's how it's supposed to work. You don't supposed to work the other way. You don't drop them back in the coverage. You always send them forward. And that's but they but they did silly crap like that too. They had the biggest defensive end in the history of uh the league playing at defensive end, which he was a defensive tackle, big Hakeem Hicks. Which, by the way, Hicks should still be on this team. I was really upset that they did, they got rid of him, by the way. You know. Faye Sway says, what's up, fam? Welcome to the show. He says, watch out for Sammy Cobb. Q, I think he'll be a force. I've heard that before, my friend. I've heard that before about Sammy Cobb. The Saints seen something in the man. You know, when he, and, and they pulled, they signed him away from Tampa Bay last year. He been on the team. And he has some advantages. And I've seen footage on Sammy. Enough because I kept getting people saying to me over and over again, hey, Q. Sammy, Sammy Cobb, Sammy Cobb, Sammy Cobb, Sammy Cobb, Sammy Cobb. I was like, man, who the hell is Sammy Cobb? And why should I give a damn about Sammy Cobb? What is Sammy Cobb going to do? My bad, Sammy Cobb Jr. What is Sammy Cobb Jr. going to do to help Saints? But see, that was the wrong attitude to have because anybody could surprise you at any given time to help you uh, move. You never know. You know, remember Lance Moore and guys like that? We brought undrafted guys aboard. Pierre Thomas, and those guys became, you know, they, they did more than role players. They stepped it up and became real stellar. Crash, thanks for your gift, man. Big Q, your show's the bomb. I got to leave the chat, take my wife to the airport, keep the videos coming, be safe. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to you, my friend, and all of the great dads out there. Thank you for your gift, and you be safe on that road to the airport, my man. And don't worry. Uh, this the the podcast, the live stream will be available late where you can listen to it at your leisure. So thank you, my friend, and uh, have a blessed day and happy Father's Day to you as well.
Uh, but yes, fam, let me ask y'all this. The, Rich, the, the, the question of the day, not question of the day, but Rashad Matthews versus Cameron Meredith. What are y'all thoughts on that versus everyone else? We know Faye Sway says Sammy Cobb is a guy that we need to keep an eye on. And, and I did do some research on Sammy Cobb and to find out what Sammy Cobb uh, is. And I remember looking up some footage on Sammy Cobb. And it's pretty interesting, man. The guy is he don't have top not, top level speed, but he has a good size, intriguing size. He's the decent catcher of the ball, too. Not to mention that he might have an advantage over some of these other guys like the Jordan Humphreys and Emmanuel Butlers and all that, because he had a chance to be immersed on the team and learn the playbook. He'd been in a wide receiver room a little longer than the rest of those guys. And there's no pressure on Sammy Cobb to do anything. So it that'll be really interesting to see exactly if Sammy Cobb can represent and come and make the team. I don't know if he plays special teams. That's the only thing, um, face way. I don't know if Sammy plays special team, does he? You know, because that's probably be his his link to make the team if he plays special teams. I'm not certain that he plays special teams, but you know, we'll have to look at that. So that's one of the questions y'all feel free to chime in on that. Welcome to the live stream. All those is coming. Hit hit the chat up. Let me know where y'all calling from. Uh, we also have live calling today, 504-475-4482. If you want to uh, hit us up here at the Sports Coma with questions, concerns, and comments, we are available for the next hour and a half on our two-hour live stream. Next question on the docket for the Saints family uh, here. Is Carl Grandison the best option behind Davenport and Jordan? What do y'all think about that? Pass rush is imperative to me. You know, the, the last several podcasts, I've been hitting this hard. I've been talking about the fact that the Saints have done some really terrific things, you know, um, in terms of picking up, you know, guys to help. Like, the sec- like say, for instance, the secondary, man. Kayvon Webster was a very good signing. I mean, seriously. Kayvon, and see, a lot of y'all not going to realize it. Some of y'all do because y'all got vision. But some most are not going to realize what Kayvon Webster will bring. I mean, all that experience, he's a, what, seven, eight-year veteran? You know? About the same amount of time in a league as P-Rob. You know? that's To me, that's exciting. This guy has speed. He's 5'11". He's experienced, and he's played with some really good cornerbacks in that Denver system. I think he won the Super Bowl that year with Denver. Super Bowl 50, I think it was. He was in that. He won the game. He has a ring. So I'm loving him. The only thing that really hurt him was the fact that he had, had accrued these injuries. Like when he was in Texans, with the Texans last year, he had injuries to several injuries to his legs that ultimately cut his season short. Prior to that, he was dealing with injuries too. I think in a limited perspective, like if you have him at the fourth string defensive back position, that'd be perfect. I love that veteran edge behind those two top men. I'm just going to be honest with you. You got Lattimore, Apple, P. Rob, and then Kayvon Webster. Because obviously you got to pencil him in over P. Rob, over uh, Patrick, uh, P.J. Williams and Ken Crawley and Justin Hardy and uh, other guys, let me la- lay them out because I don't want to leave anybody out here because I got my depth chart, my current depth chart up about all the guys. Now, there's Lattimore and Apple. Then there is Patrick Robinson. Then you look at the fact that the team did eat, have Kayvon Webster. Then there's P.J. Williams. Then there's Ken Crawley. Then there's other guys that people don't know uh, from the cornerback room. Of course, we know about Justin Hardy and then Christian Campbell, the undrafted guy. And then Marcus Shrells, who a lot of people pencil in there. And of course, the the option that Chauncey Gardner Johnson might be a guy that you kind of throw in the mix as well. You know, when you go to that three nickel position, you hear Gardner Johnson's name called when that nickel position comes because he basically a cornerback with safety with a, a safety with cornerback abilities. Face Way say he's a big wide receiver with jumping ability on tape. He's always jumping, out jumping guys. Yeah, you know what? That's right, Face Way. Uh, I've seen that he can elevate, but the question is, I don't. That's the thing, you know. It's a tough position. The wide receiver room is super competitive, super competitive. Then you add guys like Chad Hansen, 
who they just picked up. Some people say he's just a camp body. I'll be more inclined, inclined to agree about Chad Hansen being a camp body. I'll agree with you on that. But I'm not in the mindset to agree with people that's saying that Rashad Matthews is a camp body. Who that, Chad? Who that, Chad, is in the building? Who that to you, my friend? Welcome aboard. Um, I would be more inclined to say that Rashad Matthews signing is super important because of what he brings. Man, come on. The man is a slot wide receiver, and right now you're in need of a veteran slot receiver. Right. He's up here. I mean, you look at it. He has more of a chance. I would even say this. He has even more of a chance to make the team than Austin Carr did. Because, you know, the, the man has the experience. He's he just needs the right system. And he's smart enough to know to come to New Orleans and play with Drew Brees, because if he can make the team, you have Mike Thomas on this side, Tay again on this side, taking the roof off, Mike doing whatever he do. Jared Cook running underneath. Elvin Kamara coming out the backfield. And then you have the slot man who's going to be where he's going to be. That slot man, whoever it is, is going to have a good, could possibly great season. Because he is the guy that a lot of people are not going to game plan for. And he's just going to be, he's going to do some things. And this guy is an excellent catcher of the ball. He had good size. He's six feet. He has deceptive speed. He ain't burning up the joint with, his, with track speed. But and he is and he's durable. Now he has some concerns before, but the guy is healthy. And of course, you know, if you put him in the correct system, a guy that can catch the ball, that can find a way to get open, Jared Cook is gonna have an excellent season as well. And there's plenty enough footballs from Drew Brees to find around, especially if you got guys underneath where you don't have to force Drew to put that 40 year old arm into action to sling the ball down the field. But you should, but guys underneath running free, if they can find the right people, will do really wonderful things, man. Well, it, it'll be excellent, terrific, man. For all those who just joined in the live screen, man, chime in, hit the chat, tell me where you're calling from or where you're chatting from, better yet. Hit a, hit the sports coma, let me know, because we got a few people on the show that hit up the chat. I know Crass hit it up, Faceway hit it up, Chad hit it up. Got uh, Day Mank, Day Mank, is that is Day Mank? Is that, I'm pronouncing that right, friend? Day Mank? on the chat and uh we got a few other people listening hit the thumbs up fam if you're not a subscriber subscribe hit the notification button as well for future content we're doing this thing every saturday at noon two hours to the dome talking saints football now let's get back to our defensive end talk we talk about the wide receiver who we got behind cam jordan and davenport a lot of people don't see that is don't we don't true saints faithful Understand how important that is to have somebody back there. Do you not understand just day man? Oh, okay, day man. Okay, sorry about <laughs> day man. All right, I got you, friend. Appreciate you. Uh, but that's th let's let's ask this question here. I mean, aren't y'all concerned that we don't have a a proven pass rusher? Behind Davenport and Jordan, I'm not concerned about Cam. Cam gonna do his thing, but Marcus Davenport, I do have concerns about Davenport, being that Marcus Davenport is it hadn't shown me a full season yet. I know it was just his rookie year, but he had several injuries throughout the year. Even after the draft, he got hurt. I'm like, how you get hurt after the draft? How you how that work? Don't tell me you was hurt and the Saints drafted you and they just didn't tell us. I would hope not. But all of a sudden, he had surgery right after the Saints drafted him. How that work? How we ain't know about that? Oh, it was minor. It's just a hand. Then it was something else. Then he was out. Then he got in. Then he was out. Then it was that's, look, man, that's too much leap leapfrogging. We need somebody that's gonna do what Cam Jordan do. That's gonna be there. Are you guys concerned that we don't have a third experienced pass rusher behind? I'm gonna say Davenport. Now, I'm going to run down the depth chart on the guys because I don't want to leave nobody out, and y'all tell me what y'all think on it. What's up, Lionel? What's happening with you, my man? What's happening? What happened to Lowen? Mitchell Lowen you're talking about? Mitchell Lowen, the defensive tackle? I think they, the Saints got rid of him last year. Although I, I, I like Mitchell Lowen, man. Mitchell Lowen was a beast. He just couldn't stay healthy. Yeah, Mitchell Lowen ain't on the team no more, Lionel. 
you know. Um, I think the Saints got rid of him last year. But Mitchell Lauren was a beast, man. I was like, man, damn, they got to give him more opportunities. No, he he's not on the team no more, bro. Yeah. But that was one of my favorite uh, under wraps guys that a lot of people didn't know about Mitchell Lauren. Mitchell Lauren get out there and wreak havoc. He just couldn't stay healthy, man. He like Trey Hendrickson to me. Trey Hendrickson's the same way. When Trey Hendrickson get out there, Trey Hendrickson is a is is a force, but he can't stay healthy. He cannot stay healthy. Let's go over the depth chart right here. I got it pulled up here. Of defensive ends. Now, pencil behind Marcus Davenport. They got a guy out of Tennessee named Shy Tuttle. Y'all guys know about them. We talked about them. They covered these undrafted guys in our podcast. We talked about Shy Tuttle being a top-notch athlete who was basically brung down by a series of injuries throughout college that kind of derailed a promising college career with Tennessee, trying to do something with the Saints. Trey Hendrickson is the most experienced of the Saints' backup defensive ends that they have. Then there's the Harvard grad, Carbon Kafusi. You know, that's a little joke from a previous uh, show. Gino Grissom is there. And then we're looking at the guy that they, the veteran defensive end that the Saints brought in from the Carolina Panthers, Wes Horton. And then there is Carl Granderson. So that's all of the depth chart. That's all of the deep, the guys that's that you guys have on the depth chart. Do any of those names stick out to your family? I mean, do any of those names ring a bell and say, man, that is definitely giving me confidence is the fact that we have Wes Horton on the team. Oh, that just gives me just just makes me feel all warm inside and not have to worry. And I don't miss sleep at night worrying about the third pass rusher position behind Davenport. If something happened to Davenport, I just feel good about Wes Horton. I just feel good about uh, uh, Carl Granderson, despite the fact that he facing that rape ball. I don't know what it is he's facing, but he had an excellent camp is what I've seen. He was most disruptive defensive end I've seen out there. He was tearing it up, Carl Granderson. And I was like, damn, this dude's going to do good for us. And just right when – He's about to take off for us. Bam. Here come the police with the handcuffs. Let me pull up some stuff from Carl Granderson, man. And I'm going to tell y'all on the show right now exactly what Carl Granderson did. What is he facing? Okay, this is coming from the Bleacher Report here. Is that Carl Granderson, this is from February the 8th of this year. Um, he's, he's charged with sexual assault. That's what it was. And they're saying, I'm going to read it verbatim here, fam. Just give me a second. According to Wyoming Channel 4 News, quote, the allegations stem from an incident following the conclusion of the 2018 football season and the end of Granderson's athletic eligibility. Because of that, the Department of Athletics cannot suspend him, which is the usual course of action for student athletes when, when felony sexual assault charges are filed against them under university policy. It said the Laramie Police Department received a call on the 26th of November and a report was filed the next day. They're saying. Wow. If convicted, it can be punishable up to 15 years in prison while sexual battery carries a one year sentence. See, and it's right now, I'm going to do a little bit more research on this on my own time. But I want to find out exactly what Carl Granderson is. Uh, what's what's the latest on Carl Granderson, man? You know, because you don't want to get, you know, like this guy that all of a sudden, you know, the, you got to get rid of him. Because, you know, the case, his case that he's dealing with is coming to bear. You know, now we know about him making tearing it up in minicamp. He was making some good moves. And and that's one of the reasons why a lot of people thought that, you know, that he was not going to be drafted is because of that sexual assault case. But this was coming from the Saints wire. It said the Saints, uh, Sean Payton, Saints comfortable with taking a risk on Carl Garrison. That's what they said. They were comfortable taking a risk on him, even signed him, gave him some money. And they said that uh, the Saints signed him after the draft, handing him all the guaranteed base salary of 70 G's and signing and giving him a signing bonus of 50 grand. You know, that's the rookie deals. Now you got that sexual assault. It's a charge of one count of third degree sexual assault and another count of sexual battery. 
Sean's expressed the trust in the staff evaluations and steered the discussion back to Grandis's performance in practice. We felt and we felt real comfortable with everything we knew. And so far, he's done a good job here. That's what Peyton's saying about Grandison. And the Saints have steered clear of players with off field, off field issues in recent histories and more than prospects. But he's banking on with Jeff Ireland saying, listen, man, I think this guy could beat it. I think he can beat it. You know, but I'm skeptical. We this is a Super Bowl year, man. I don't want to deal with that. You hear me? You hear me, family? I don't want to deal with Carl Granderson's rape charge or sexual battery. That's a little too much. Now, if it's a DUI or something, even if it was you, even if it was something silly as receiving weed in the mail. <laughs> I could deal with that. You hear me? But not when you touching doing you you touching on that girl over there. She don't want you to touch on her, man. What's wrong with you, man? What's wrong with you, fool? That's you know. I mean, if you hear sexual, they say, okay, the news come out. Oh, Big Q is accused of sexual battery and in rape charge. You gonna you gonna turn this show off? Look at this split. You ain't gonna listen to me. Say, man, this fool up here trying to talk about the Saints and they charged with rape. I mean, it's just not, we ain't going to say that he's guilty of whatever he is because they do run them games out there. They are, they do got them girls. They got some of them girls out there. Some of them got games going on with them and they're charging these people. They see these guys and they all ask for money. And man, say, I ain't giving you jack squat. Well, I'm going to say you did this to me. That's been, that's actually facts and that happens all the time. But then again, some of them guys are actually guilty. Look what Darren, oh, no, I ain't going to even say that, dude. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, Chad. I feel de- Chad says I definitely concerned about the matter. In fact, person, that's my biggest concern. We got to have a rotation of guys who can get pressure. Chad, man, you've been you you we was talking about this on a previous podcast when we you were commenting and the last live stream we talked about the pass rush position, and you was like, yes, that's a key focus of concern because you got to be honest. You look at everything else that the Saints address. They got the cornerback position addressed. They got a they got a cornerback in there that's backing up uh, P. Rob. Now, if P. Rob suffers from ankle injuries or whatnot, we got an eight-year, seven, eight-year veteran that's back behind P. Rob. That gives me relief. I feel good knowing that I got an eight-year veteran that has a Super Bowl ring that competed on a Super Bowl team who's a pretty good cornerback in Kayvon Webster. That makes me feel good. That gives me peace of mind. The wide receiver position, which we talked about before, that we needed another wide receiver, and I said, I don't think they're done yet. I gave two guys from the last live stream. You didn't get them, but my guy was Pierre Garcon, and the other guy was uh, Bruce. Was it was Ellington? He used to play for the Texans. I was like, I pass Rashad Matthews. What the hell was I thinking? Because he would have been the perfect player for what the Saints doing. They needed a slot man. You get one. I guarantee it's a super cheap contract too. I guarantee you, it's going. The contract going to be so cheap. It's almost like he going to be paying them to play. <laughs> all right what's happening lionel said davenport highly concerned none none really granderson eh cam has two be our iron man well he's cam gonna be the man you know we give him that extension and cam locked up for the saints for five years estimated at 74 over 74 million if i'm not mistaken exactly 74.5 million it's his he's got two years left on his current deal with the three that he's just signed gives him a max of five seventy four point five million. Now, it might go up higher than that if he reaches incentives like they get to the playoffs, they get to the Super Bowl. All that gives him extra money. But the reality at the end of the day is Cam Jordan's a saint for life, man. And I'm just happy for that. That's one thing that the Saints don't have to worry about. Now, of course, Sean said in the interview that Mike Thomas is the next dude that they're talking about. And I think it's terrific. Let's get Mike in. And Cam out of the way right now. Then we got Marshawn Lattimore we got to worry about. Then we got other players that we got to contribute. But to call your team, you got to keep Mike Thomas. You got to keep Cam. You got to get Lattimore on the contract. And eventually Elvin Kamara. And then you might have a few other people to pay, pay as well. But the Saints are doing the right thing. They got to keep this team competitive, man. Jason, what's up, Jason? Welcome to the show, man. Oh, it's all right, buddy. You, 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 you're not late, man. You're right on time, buddy. We're talking some Saints stuff here. We just mentioned we had an early discussion. We was talking about Rashad Matthews versus Cam Ryan Meredith. Feel free to chime in on that thought. Who do you think? Why, why, what do you think will win that battle? If not, um, 
Faye Sway says he like uh, Sammy Cobb Jr. in the mixture. You know, they got a lot of people that like LaJordan Humphreys. You know, uh, you know, I, I haven't heard too much Chad Henson fans. <laughs> but they got him out there. But, you know, uh, even Traquan Smith for that motion. I had anybody beating the block for Traquan Smith. But that's one of the questions that we throw in. And now we're getting into the, com uh, the conversation about who's the third pass rusher behind Davenport and Cam. We know Cam going to represent. Davenport, I'm not certain. He says he's healthy. He, him and Cam went to Von Miller's uh, pass rush camp, which is intriguing for them to learn a little few more exercises and whatever tricks of the trade to get better. And Davenport's definitely going to turn it on if he's healthy. But the thing is, can he remain healthy for a full season? You know, I don't know. He hadn't showed me that yet. Lionel says, not feeling that. Let him roll out. <laughs> Dada Saints number one. What's up, fam? Welcome to the show. Matthews over Cam. I would love to see Emmanuel Butler show out, though. See, we got a Emmanuel Butler guy. See? See, I know sooner or later we're going to get an Emmanuel Butler guy. They have guys that are beating the block for Emmanuel Butler. I got Face Way says Sammy Cobb Jr. I got uh, Dada Saints fan number one saying, hey, man, don't forget about the Butler. Emmanuel Butler. See, in you know, I don't know, they beat the block. The only thing we need is our La Jordan Humphrey guys, Chad Hansen guys, Deontay Harris guys, Cyril Grayson guys. Who else we got? Austin Carr guys. Although Austin Carr, man, they, you should have heard the last live stream. Guys was killing Austin Carr, killing him. Say, Q, the man done. He can't separate. Man don't have no speed. It was just killing Austin, man. If Austin would have heard that show, he probably would have ran to his nearest bridge. It's like, damn, people think I can't ball, man. You know, they think I can't ball. Not that, Austin. And in certain circumstances, you probably would be pretty good. But, I mean, remember he was dropping passes last year. I'm like, you can't do that, dude. You don't have no speed. You know, the only thing you have is hands. You're not really that tall. It's like six feet or something like that. But he can catch. But he wasn't catching last year in tra in pre in training camp. He was showing out. That's what got him that attention. After that, regular season came. Keith Kirkwood went up here. Austin Call was here. Then you had those injuries that happened. Then Ted again was taken out of the equation. Then you had Trey Quine up here and those other guys underneath, and they just could not be consistent enough to to earn you know to to get that you know. Dada says, car need to go a waste of a spot, in my opinion. See, Austin Carr, man, the Saints family is not feeling you, brother. They're not feeling you, man. And they're not hating on you. It's just they know what they're looking at, man. These are these these black, these black and gold guys, they're geniuses, man. They know what they're talking about. But you know, like I said, man, that's some of the things that we we mentioned about. What do you guys think about that? Let me ask you this. What who do you like behind Davenport and Cam off the path? I just laid them out. I called everybody out. They can't say, Q, you ignoring guys. I ran down the entire depth chart of everybody that's a defensive end from Cam Jordan to, to Kafusi, you know, down to West Horton. I done laid them all out. Carl Granderson with his rape stuff. Who do you guys like? Y'all chime in, tell me who y'all like. And in the backup, because obviously I think the Saints probably still going to address it as one of the last moves left. And they do have a few guys out there. I remember I threw some names out in the last live stream. I threw out Nick Perry uh, and I also threw out the guy from um, from the Tennessee Titans. Uh, what's his name? My name escapes me right now. What was his name? Derek Morgan. There you go. Derek Morgan. And these two guys, Derek Morgan, 44 and a half sacks on his career, eight, nine, 10 year career. And the other guy, Nick Perry, who's a pretty much a Green Bay Packer, drafted by the Packers, a Packer for the duration of his career as a free agent right now. He had 33 and a half sacks, or 33 sacks. That's pretty good for a guy with seven, eight years in the league, man. That guy knows how to get to the quarterback. We need guys like that. We don't need to teach nobody nothing. We need a guy that can come in and do what he do what he know how to do get after the quarterback when Cam or Davenport get hurt or get tired. Go after the quarterback. Y'all chime in on that. Like I said, fam, welcome to the Sports Coma live stream. 
you can feel free to hit the show up. You can call. Um, you can feel free to call. The call number is in the chat. You can call us live or hit the chat up with questions, concerns, and comments. Now, we talking Saints. Uh, earlier, we had uh, we had uh, who that Chubbs 504 chime in and, and ask, do we need, can we talk Pelicans as well? We could talk either or, man. Whatever you feel like <clears throat> you want to ask, go ahead and ask it, fam. We, we, got, we got it going on here. Okay, the next co- topic discussion we talked about the Davenport news. Y'all chime in and tell me about that, man. Who you like behind Davenport and Cam Jordan? And here we got a few comments. Swept man, what's happening, people? He chiming in. He says Rashard Matthews could be that Lance Moore type of player. The Saints' offense has been missing. That's a really high praise to give him that swept man. And I'm gonna tell you what I've watched that guy play. You know, and he is very good in that area of field. Just going to be honest with you. And you use them when you get a guy that's regularly less normal in um, an area of field with somebody else. He usually comes here, and if he does what he did there, he becomes extraordinary because that's how friendly the system is. You got a friendly, a wide receiver, friendly quarterback. Drew Brees doesn't discriminate with the ball. He fires to the wide open guys. And remember, there was a few years ago where Drew Brees had guys with four or five receivers with, with over 45 catches. Remember that? And that was like unheard of. That's what Drew does, man. If you're wide, if you can get wide open, and part one is getting open, and part two is catching the ball. If you could do that, Drew Brees will find you every time, man. That's what he do. That's what he'll do. Dada Saint said Granderson, but Horton experience may shine more in preseason. You know, Horton is an interesting character, man. You know, and he came in with not much fanfare. I know he was a former um uh Carolina Panther. But Wes Horton, man, is not known to be a pass rusher. And I think that's what the, the Saints were looking for. I don't know what the idea is for Wes Horton. I don't know if Horton's the guy that you want to sign to back up Davenport. I think he's more of a guy that probably would back up Cam. You know what I'm saying? Now I got his, his information pulled up here. Six foot five, 266 uh, pounds. Now he definitely, he does sound like a pass rusher with that weight and that size. Cause that's like what Grant Granderson, matter of fact, that's almost what Carl Granderson is to the T. Now on his career, on his career, let me make sure this is correct because I know he played more than those years. Yeah, he, this guy has been in the league for seven years. And his total numbers, tackles, 93 tackles total, and 15 and a half sacks in seven years. Now, you think about that. That don't sound like a pass rusher to me. The guy like 15 sacks now in seven years. I just told you guys about two guys um, – Derek Morgan, who I know y'all know Derek Morgan, and Nick Perry, I know y'all know who Nick Perry is. Morgan, who played for the Tennessee Titans recently as a free agent, both guys are free agents, that guy has 44 and a half sacks, man, in the same seven to eight year span as Wes Horton. Now, I know Horton's been like a career backup or something like that. You get, get in there and spot duty. You know, we might find a Lorenzo Alexander. Stuff like that does happen. Remember Lorenzo Alexander did with Buffalo? Came out of the blue nowhere. Guy like 30, late 30s or something like that. And was had like a multi-sack year, double-digit sack year. It does happen. But are you really expecting that from Wes Horton? I've watched Wes Horton play. You know, I'm not saying that he can't become a guy that makes 10 sacks in a year. But I don't know if Horton would be the guy that I would count on. His best year in, in terms of getting sacks, he had five and a half sacks back in 2017 that's not bad that's not bad he played games he didn't start any games you know what that's actually pretty decent though he in 16 games his best season was as far as sacks are concerned was in 2017 with the panthers he had 17 combined tackles in 16 games he had five and a half sacks that year that was his best year that's 15 and a half sacks on the on the uh on the career how y'all like that y'all y'all think that's good is that the guy you want to know six five two sixty five would wait like that you think he can get after him he's not like a like a traditional defensive end like six five two seventy two eighty you know i, I i'm not sure about west horton being that guy 
Granderson, yes, I doubt I says Granderson. I don't know about Granderson either. I mean, could he kick that charge? Jeff Ireland thinks so. The Saints wasted their money on him, so they must feel like they could. And, Jeff, and Sean Payton, best basically, when they threw the question at him, he just deflected it and said, well, listen, our, I trust my guys, meaning Jeff Ireland, because Jeff Ireland is the guy that did the research on Ireland, uh, on uh, Granderson to see what was going on. That's why Granderson wasn't drafted, because he had that cloud over his head of rape, rape, sexual misconduct floating around nfl said oh well no we're not gonna touch that man we ain't gonna touch that we remember ray rice we remember this this fool down here in kansas city hill and that other guy hunt we don't touch that right now Sank said you know what me 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 i don't know about granderson although i like his talent i just don't know man west horton how about kafusi <laughs> shy tuttle that's what i'm saying it's a i don't know man it's, it's very, it's up in the air. It's too up in the air. You know what I'm saying, family? It's too up in the air. It's a glaring need is the backup pass rusher. The third pass rusher is a very important position because sooner or later, Cam's going to get tired and have to come out. So is Davenport. And what you do? Big Killer, is that right? Big C Killer, what's up, fam? Welcome to the show. Uh, he says, uh, does Rashad have a legitimate shot at being a starting slot in week one? Oh, he most certainly does. No no doubt about it. It was a question that was asked on the live stream that stumped me. Who your starting slot man is? And I looked, I was like, uh, Cameron, uh, Meredith? Uh, Cameron? Remember that, Chad? Chad was on the live stream, man. The guy stumped, man. I told him, I said, I ain't going to, you know, like some guys, you get on there, you ask a question, like they run you all in circles. Run you in circles. And tell you a bunch of shit that you, that's not the answer. That's not the answer, man. That's not what I asked. I asked. No, we don't. I'm not going to do that. If I don't know, I'm going to tell you I don't know. And But I tell you what, you come back next time, I had an answer for you. That's what kind of person I am. I ain't going to just run you in circles with some bull crap. If I don't know, I know. But last show, I was like, I don't know. Because Cameron Meredith, they, he's not ready. He's not hasn't practiced yet. And then behind him, Traquan Smith. And I said, Traquan Smith's not really a slot man. Not to me. He more plays where Ted Ginn Jr. is. So he's not a slot man. Then there was Keith Kirkwood. And I was like, I don't know whether or not the Saints will give him enough snaps. Then there was Austin Carr. Then it went down and down and down. So I, I, but most certainly, my friend, I would say certainly that he has an opportunity to win. If he just do what he did with the Titans and the Jet, well, not so much for Jets because they ain't play him that much, but what he did with, with the Titans, where he had the niche to get open to find a quarterback, man, that guy got it all day. He has, he's the most experienced of the slot men. Well, you got to look at Cam Meredith too. But as far as the size and getting underneath things and making plays happen, Rashad Matthews most certainly. That's why that's why I'm really excited about Rashad Matthews because he can steal that third receiver a slot position from the guys that's supposed to have it. Can't, and it's it's the it's a loose position. Isn't you know it's up in the air. If it was Cam Ryan Meredith's position, they wouldn't assign Rashad Matthews. The Saints obviously feel like they don't think Mer Meredith is gonna make it. Why would else? What else would you do it? And you got Keith Kirkwood and Traquan and all these other guys sitting back here saying, "Okay, I'm ready." Why would? Why else would we go in that direction? So I definitely agree with you, man. I would say, hell yeah, he can be start for week one. He got all that experience. He can catch the ball. He can find a way to get open. He he has deceptive speed. He ain't full full guy. I ain't saying all that, but man, he knows how to get separation. He knows how to get to the pockets to make the plays. And he just got a knack for it. That guy is incredibly productive. And Drew Brees is going to love that guy. He's going to love him. So I do like the fact that, who was that said? That swept man who compared him to Lance Moore. You know, Lance Moore had that, had a little, he was a little bit faster than this guy. But after those injuries started happening to him, he, you know, he slowed down, but he never, he never lost them hands. But yeah, you know, most certainly, certainly that he could take that position. Dada says Morgan and Perry may ask for too much cash, though Horton as a back 
five five and, and a half sacks is pretty good. Back up five and a half. I agree with you, Dada. That's that's true. You know, and he did that as and he didn't even start and he got five and a half sacks. That's not bad. That was a couple of years ago. But can he reproduce that set that that type of success, that kind of statistics down here? I don't know. You know, that's the thing that we have to w- wait and see what goes on here. What's up, Jason? What's happening, man? Jason says Rashad Matthews will be our slot if Traquan Smith don't step up. Great pickup. Meredith, slat, sadly, I think, is done, bro. Yeah, yep, yep. That's what it's shaping up to be. That's why I posed that question is Rashad Matthews versus Cameron Meredith. With the Saints sign him, that uh, Rashad Matthews is not looking to be no fourth string wide receiver. No, he's a slot wide receiver, and he works well in the slot. And he just so happens to be eat better or the same or not. Even if you say, Q, I disagree with you. I don't think he's better than Cameron Meredith in the slot. But it's the fact that the matter is he's his equal. If not, he's better. You see what I'm saying? So his floor is where Cameron Meredith's floor is. They come in like this. He don't come in like this. He come in like this. And he has the advantage because guess what? He's healthy. And Cam Meredith is not. He's working out with trainers, but he's not on the field where this guy is. So he has an advantage. Even though it might be a slight one, it's still enough to kind of get him ahead. Sometimes that's all you need in the league, especially if he might come from a team that identify what what he was doing. He picked the right team to come through because the verbiage might be slightly off and he could be able to say, okay, well, this means that and this means that. And the guy might be able to pick up a little faster Cameron Meredith being he's out there actually running the routes, actually building that synergy with the quarterback. It could definitely be an advantage for Matthews. That's why I said then this is a sneaky good signing like the Kayvon Webster deal is. I love those two signings. I'm just going to be honest with you. The Kayvon Webster move was an excellent move. And this move with Rashad Matthews was an excellent move by the New Orleans Saints organization to beef up, to add experience to the wide receivers behind the top men because there's a drop-off there, undrafted guys and all this kind of stuff. So we need some more experience. You get Rashad Matthews, been in the league for several seasons. Go on the defensive side, say, man, I'm kind of leery behind P-Rob. So what they do, Kayvon Webster, bring him in, sign him. So you got a seven- or eighth-year veteran behind p rob in case something happens that gives me all the confidence and peace of mind i need in my secondary with kevon webster back there and then you look at like what the wild with rashad matthews really sneaky good signings and bottom cheap prices i'm telling you watch with, with uh he's and, uh, yeah dada said morgan let me address that to dada number one he says morgan the pair of me asked for too much though yeah mark but that that's the thing you know usually you know, you look at the market for those guys. Those guys are waiting toward the big camp start, then they'll get an invitation to play. Those guys are not going to break the bank. You know, they're not going to break the bank because you get the closer you get to the season, the cheaper they got to come because the demand. A lot of those guys went through free agency period. They nobody liked they they, they what they were offering, and they have to drop that price if they want to play. And the Saints are already dealing with what less than eight million dollars. And if they can bring in a guy like uh, like uh, Derek Morgan and give him a signing bonus, you know, five or six million, and say, okay, look, I'll give you two or three million a year with incentives. You can get eight, nine sacks. We'll do this for you. You play this many games, we'll do this for you. Uh, you know, we'll give you a five, six million dollar signing bonus, you know, all that kind of stuff where it don't impact the cap or whatever they need to do. You're gonna see uh that. But I think they can get these guys. I don't think it'll be too expensive to get these guys this late in the process, especially heading to camp. Now you get a little competition as camp start, but you know, at this stage of their careers, I'm hoping that they will be thinking, you know what? I won't go somewhere where I could possible start. You get a guy like Derek Morgan here. It could be very well that he can actually start over Davenport. I mean, seriously, if you signed Ziggy Ansah, if the Saints had went on and signed Ziggy Ansah, Ziggy Ansah would have started over Davenport. Do you not agree? Dada, do you not agree with that? Holler at me in the chat. Big C Killer said, what problems has he had in the in recent terms of production? Who are you referring to, uh, Big C Killer? Who are you referring to? Dada says, what round would Grandison got draft, do you think? I don't know. It had to be the later rounds. You know, anywhere between like five and seven. That's why I think where they were initially building Carl Grandison because he wasn't blowing the doors off when he was in college. 
but he was definitely like a day three pick anywhere between a five and seven round, possibly like a five or six round guy, something like that. I wouldn't be surprised if he would have went late fourth round, you know, but, you know, but he wasn't, they wasn't really going after him like that, you know. Yeah, Dada, I agree with me on the, on the Webster edition. Jason, Jason says, yo, Q, you know what the Matthew signing does, though, right? It squashes all the Des Bryant signing with us now. You know what? I didn't even think about that, Jason. I didn't even think about that. It it most certainly does eliminate Des, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's a sad, man, sad. That upsets me because I really I thought Des Bryant, man, I, I was one of those guys that really wanted Des Bryant to be back on this team. I really did, man. You know, I just I just I just wanted to see that Drew Brees, the Des Bryant connection. I knew it could have worked. But I think you're right, Jason. It does squash Des Bryant unless somebody gets hurt. Then you can bring Des in later. But as far as right now, oh, yeah, man, Des Bryant is definitely out of the question. You get Rashad Matthews here. So that's true. I agree. Yep. Chad agrees. He said Matthews has a higher floor, but probably a lower ceiling than Merritt. That's a good way to look at it, Chad. I would agree with that, too. I would agree with that. Because you're looking at a guy in Cameron Merritt, if that's what, 6'3", 6'4", 220 pounds, attacks the ball as the highest. But you're dealing with a guy that has to beat injuries psychologically and the pressure that we put on people here in New Orleans. Remember, we're not like most people. We put some pressure on you here in New Orleans. If you're not doing it, we're going we're gonna to bang you up here. So, you know, can he come? That's that's the thing with Cameron Merritt. I'm I'm when I when we got him, it's like I love that. I love that size. He's big, he can catch, he attacks the ball, but the injuries things, how how long we gotta wait for him? How long we gonna wait for for this guy? You can't wait for him. Maybe if you had a quarterback that was like the guy from the Jets or the guy from Arizona, you know, you had a couple of years before they got to where you thought they were going to be elite. Then you could kind of be patient. But we got a 40-year-old Hall of Fame quarterback with his going into his last few years. How how long are you going to wait on Cameron Meredith? That was a signing where we know what we was going to get. This guy does this. We need him to do this now. He didn't do it. He can't get on the field. That's why the Saints were going to get rid of him last year. Y'all remember that? Google the article, y'all. Y'all get an opportunity. Don't believe me. Don't believe me. Check it out, baby. Their Saints was going to get rid of Cameron Meredith last year. They presented him with a pay cut. He took a pay cut. He took a pay cut to stay with the team last year. If he said, man, I ain't taking no freaking pay cut, guess what he went? He'd have been cut. He'd have been cut last year, but he took a pay cut to remain with the team. You know, and he did take a lot of money. and He gave some of that money back, man, because his production simply not there. So, yeah, Chad, I, I agree with you, man. You know, but he got to get to that. That's the thing. And the injury is a major thing that's preventing him from getting to the level where he's supposed to be. You know, seriously. This web man says, uh, Marcus Colston, Thomas Devery Henderson, again, uh, Ted again, Robin Meacham. Then you got Smith Kirkwood. It's Lance. Okay, hold on. Let me see. Marcus Colston, he's comparing him to Thomas. Devery Henderson is again, and Robert Meacham is Smith, Kirkwood. Lance Moore is Matthews. Reggie Bush, Pierre Thomas, Elwood Kamara, Mike Bell, Murray, Jeremy Shockey, Cook. Yeah, facts. You know, Sweb Man, man, it's that's interesting comparisons, man. You know, it is because Thomas is every bit with Mark. He's going to take every record Marcus Colston set, no doubt about it. And um, Smith and Kirkwood is like Lance Moore. I don't know. I think Lance is a better catcher of the ball than those guys are. Kirkwood's pretty good now. Smith is, I think he was just nervous as a rookie. He looked at slow and stiff to me. Rashad Matthews, Reggie equals Lance Moore. Matthew, Reggie Bush, Pierre Thomas equals Kamara. Mike Bell equals Murray. Jeremy Shockley equals Cook. Yeah, that's good comparisons, man. Yeah. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree with you on that. That was pretty good makeup there. You know, we just got to see what Traquan Smith's going to do. He's the mixture to all that. 
Yeah. Jason says, hell, you remember how many years Peyton stuck with Nick Toon? Oh, my goodness. Nick Toon. L Toon. Remember L Toons is uh, his father, Hall of Fame jet wide receiver. Yeah, I remember them years with him and Nick Toon. I remember all those years when Nick Toon was battling with uh, Brandon Ing- or with Brandon Coleman. That's when Brandon Coleman first got on the team. They drafted Nick Toon at the University of Wisconsin. And Nick Toon had all this stuff about how he was supposed to be good, this, that, third, and all this, and it never materialized. He went away, and ultimately they brought Brandon Coleman on a board. And Coleman, they were intrigued by Coleman's size, and he had all this stuff. He had that fantastic offseason that year and preseason. He was catching everything. Then he got into the season and fizzled. And I think mostly with Brandon Coleman, it was mental. It was he, he it was mostly mental because he had all of the physical makeup that it take to be a great player. He just it just never materialized for him. But yeah, I remember Nick Toon. That was that didn't go so well for the Saints. But he was high on Nick Toon. He thought he could be every bit as good as his, his father was. And and most people find out that they got really great Hall of Fame dads that not not always, more time than not, that those guys end up not fulfilling, living up the expectations that their father did. Yeah, what a bus. Webman said, what a bus. Yeah, that one. You notice my tone went down. I was like, hell yeah, yeah. Then when they nicked to, oh man, God. Lee. It went down because you remember the years that you were stinking, man. Nick Toon could do something. Boy, he j- it just never materialized. Never went anywhere. Dada says, makes me kind of hate Ryan Pace and their DR and Shy Town was not right. Not signing Cam back. Hate that though. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but they knew what they was getting into. They knew the they knew the reports, the medical reports on what was going on with Cam. We just didn't. You know, we fell for the one too. You know, but this guy is not proven. I mean, he's like, well, we're gonna be patient with Cam this year. We think we can come back. Did you hear that? And if you heard it, then why is Rashad Matthews here? That's the thing. Come on, speak to me, uh, Saint Nation. Say, speak to me, Black and Gold family. Speak to me, Sports Coma fam. Y'all follow the show, man, because y'all intelligent, y'all smart sports people that love to put that together, man. Y'all put the pieces of puzzles together. That's that's like me. You know, y'all talk to me. What do y'all think about that, man? You know, if that was the case about talking about what happened with Cameron Meredith, if they really believe that Cameron Meredith was ready to go this year, then why are we dealing? Why is Rashad Matthews here? You know, why is he here? If they saw Chad Hansen and it just left it at that, then I'll say Chad Hansen. I don't. The chances are that he will challenge Cameron Meredith for his slot position. And you sign Rashad Matthews, man. That puts him right on top of the man. It puts him right next to him. Like I'm here to take this third slot. I know I ain't gonna be able to take Tay again. But what if Tay again have problems? What if Tay again goes down? Who you think gonna step up there? You gonna put Traquan Smith over there? Yeah, I, I would put Traquan Smith over there. You know, I have to. I took him with the third round pick. I got to see what he can do. Number nine in the slot. That's. That's Matthew's position. Ryan Nod, what's up, Ronald? He said, what up, Q? Traquan's your number two. He's ready. <laughs> uh, Ted, number two is Ted again, bro. You know, with Rashad Matthews is the slot man, I say Traquan Smith now becomes your number four wide receiver, which is not a bad place for him to be, you know, by the way, to think about it, because the Saints could use different packages where they open up and bring the speedsters out there and trick once, make him get a little burn that way. You know, I wouldn't use him in a kick return, punt return game, but I think that he's a guy that can learn from a guy like Ted and Jr. Because I don't know, I think Ted again got, what, another year or two left on his contract? You know, and remember from time to time, never forget from time to time that Ted again Jr. and Sean Payton fall out. Remember it was a time where Ted again was healthy and he wasn't playing, remember that? Because he was in Sean Payton's doghouse. It was like, well, you got Ted against healthy. Why the hell he playing? You know, because he got in his doghouse. And it was several times that I, I've noticed that Sean Payton and Ted again fall out. And he's been trying to replace his ass ever since uh, Ted again got here. He's been trying to find a speech to, to put over there to run Ted again out of here. Get that, get some of that money back. You know, and Ted again kind of weird too, you know. Kind of weird too. I don't know. Maybe that's just how it is. I don't know. But it just, you can notice relationship between uh, Sean Payton and Ted again goes sour every now and again. And it correlates with his playing time. You can tell when he in Coach Payton doghouse. What up, Young Bloods 46? What up, my friend? Welcome to the show. He says, with Tommy Lee Lewis going to the Lions, 
who do you think uh, is the favorite to be the Saints punt returner this year? Good question, brother. I think Young Bloods 46. Young Bloods 46. Wasn't you the one that asked on the previous live stream who our slot man was? Remember that? Or are you to ask who the slot, who was going to be the starting slot man? Remember you asked that, friend? Was that you? I think it was you that answered, asked that question. And I said, you stumped me. Remember, I said, I don't know. And I did a stupid face. I was like, something like that, remember? Was that you? That was you. <laughs> I got the answer for you, brother. I got the answer for you today. Guess who it's going to be? It's going to be Rashad Matthews if Cameron Meredith. Well, you know what? It's going to be Rashad Matthews. I ain't going to even throw no if in that trade coin. I mean, listen, Meredith is, he got to come from way here to get that man ready to go, man. And that's that man is a slight NFL veteran slot receiver that does it well. He's not one of the best he ain't up there doing it, but the man is is made for that stuff. So if anything, if you the clearest answer you're going to get is it's definitely got to be Rashad Matthews. That's why the Saints signed that man. They're not confident in Cameron Meredith coming back to help. And if anybody out there, let me ask you all out there, do anybody out there believe that they'll keep both of them? Huh? Come on with it. Do anybody out there thinks that they keep Rashad Matthews and Rashad, uh, Rashad Matthews and Cam Meredith? Do anybody out there? Ronald says never. Thank you, Ronald. It's not going to happen. You don't sign Rashad Matthews, who's known to be a pretty damn good, respectable slot man, to compete with the slot man you signed two years ago, who's currently on the injured list, if I believed in you. Oh, I believe in you, and I pat you here. Yeah, I believe in you, man. And then I go over here and say, hey, man, come on over here. I'm going to sign you here. Come on over here. You're going to – nah, it don't work like that. I wouldn't even play for a guy like that either. I couldn't even trust him. I'd be like, man, you – Crazy. That'd be like what Perkins, Big Perk, said about Dale Demps. Called him a liar, and he was happy he was fired. I was like, damn! Damn! I thought this stuff was supposed to be politically correct. You ain't supposed to be saying, you know? I like that, man. I ain't gonna lie to you. I like it when you tell it like it is. He call you, call him, he say he's a liar, and I'm glad he fired. That's what I would say to a guy that would pat me on my back and say, man, listen, I know you had some troubles. You know, we signed you. We believe in you. We believe in you. Okay? Go in there and finish rehabbing. Then you walk away. And then he turned around to the dude and said, hey, Rashad Matthews. Yeah, come on. Gotcha. One year. Uh-uh. That ain't going work. Now, let me ask you a qu question, young blood 46. Let me ask you a question, man. You said, um, who's going to be the favorite, the kick returner? Well, I got a, the, the answer is clear. It's Marcus Shrells currently. Marcus Shrells. Now, it's an intriguing second option. A lot of people like Cyril Grayson, but I'm just going to be honest with you. Marcus Shrells is up here because he's a guy that did it well for many years in the league. You know, he does it well. He's a special teams guy. He built his bone on that. Why the, the Saints signed that man? Because they look at him even a veteran guy that know what the hell he's doing back there. But it just didn't start with Marcus Shrells. They also brought in Dan Rizzi and change the entire special teams room. Now, we covered this on the last live stream about four hours long, you know, but we covered it and we talked about how, you know, the Saints totally revamped the special teams room, started with Dan Rizzi, a new assistant coach, new assistant coaches, and then went about bringing in punt returners and kick returners to access it. Now, behind Marcus Shrells, he's, the, he's definitely the top dude. Behind him is an intriguing option. It's not Cyril Grayson, in my opinion. Is Deontay Harris. Now, Deontay Harris is hurt right now, but he should be ready to go when the really stuff, when the real stuff hits up. Now, this is the kid from Assumption that broke all those records. And the Saints are really interested to see because this guy got a gift at doing that. What Deontay Harris will bring, and then there's Cyril Grayson underneath that. You know, so that's the top three. But the top one, the answer is, is Marcus Shrells is our kick return. That's what I punt return. That's what I have to give it to you. So that's my answer to you. Yeah, Chad Chad agrees with me. He says uh, Shrells will be the best kick returner we have in a very long time. Now, remember, yeah, it's going to be fun watching him. That's right, Chad. Big ups. Uh, Jason says, what about the Jordan Humphreys, Q? You think he could possibly push for a slot spot? It's getting it's getting crowded in that old wide receiver room. 
remember to bring to make mention of it, guys. They did they signed Rashad Matthews, but they did cut Traven Durrell. So Durrell is the LSU guy is gone. You know, he's out of here. And it, it gets tougher and tougher because you like, okay, who's gonna make the team? You going they got a couple of practice squad players. I could see a couple of practice squad players, but you got Sammy Cobb Jr., you got Emmanuel Butler, you have uh Austin Carr that's still there, you know, underneath, you know, uh Traquan Smith. It starts from Traquan down. You got Traquan, you then uh, in no certain order, Emmanuel Butler, Sammy Cobb Jr. Um you got Chad Hansen, who I think will probably get the axe before any of them get the axe. And then you got the kick return, the punt return. It's Deontay Harris, Cyril Grayson. And those guys. Then Chad Hansen, I mentioned him. So then LaJordan Humphreys. So LaJordan Humphreys is obviously the guy they're intrigued about. But these guys are going to have to separate when the camps start. When you start having these camps, they're going to have to show up and show out. You know, they, you're going to have to show up and show out. Because it's a crowded room. And right now, the only way some of these other guys is not that's underneath the fourth wide receiver going to make it is they got to play special teams. If you can't play special teams, that's why a guy like Cyril Grayson or a guy like Deontay Harris, which are um, wide receivers, will make the team because of special teams play. After the fourth, even I would say the fourth wide receiver, and Saints might let it go if they base him. They say, okay, we might need a guy that could be here, but he's still going to have to play some manner of special team. He's going to have to do it. You know, and, and that that's the key to it. If you do anything underneath that four, that three wide receiver position, you're going to have to learn to play special teams. And can LaJordan Humphrey play special teams? You know, what could he do? That's the answer. All right, guys. Uh, Thank you all um, for keep the questions coming. Remember that, you know, we're going to keep on turning. We still got another 30 minutes or so. Uh, Feel free. Uh, like I said, you can keep hitting up the chat. We can keep doing it. Or you can call in live. The number's in the chat, 504-475-4482 to chat with me live <clears throat> on the show or on the chat like we're doing right now. And we're covering a lot of topics. And we're gonna, I'm going to keep answering the chat questions and as well. Uh, like we said, the past watch question, y'all can feel free to sling them out. Rashad Matthews versus Cam Meredith, who wins? Carl Granderson, is he our best option bef- behind Cam Jordan and Davenport for third? The third pass rush position, that's one of the ones. And one we ain't touched on yet that I want, I'm going to throw out there is who is the insurance behind Teron Armstead? You know, what's up, Shandon? Shandon's in the chat. What's going on, brother? He said, Shrell's is our punt returner, not kick returner. There you go. Uh, let me let me ask y'all this, man. Let me throw this out there to y'all, man, uh, about the offensive line. We talked about the defensive line. We talked about the wide receiver room. How about the offensive line? The O-line. Let's get to the O-line. Armstead. You know, several seasons, he constantly getting hurt. We covered this in podcasts in the previous live stream. What's the what is our options behind Armstead? Do we got a competent tackle? That's not a guard that you have to try that you got to kick out to tackle. Do we have a competent tackle that we can rely on uh here? Is is uh I like Marshall Newhouse. That was a nice sign and another under the road sign. A lot of guys mentioned it. Former Carolina Panther Mark veteran offensive lineman. Marshall Newhouse, I like him. What do you guys think about the backup offensive tackle position? Another key position of concern. Is it solved with the acquisition of Newhouse? And then the other question, the final question on today's live stream is what are you what is the what impact Kayvon Webster will make on a team? What is his impact on the team? What do you think about Kayvon Webster's addition to the Saints secondary? What kind of impact you think is going to be? Jason King. Uh, he, he says it's going to be Pete. That's the, that's the, the, the Sean Payton two-step, isn't it? When that Taron Armstead goes out, Andrews Pete shifts and go to the left tackle. And that's why I always sit up here with people blast him. They say, Andrews Pete is garbage. Andrews Pete is no good. Oh, he need to get rid of Andrews Pete. And then I got to remind people that Andrews Pete is the guy that they always moving around. They don't move nobody else around on that offensive line. They were doing it at first ram check. When Pete suffered injury, they had to move him. Remember they did that? Then they said, you know what? Let's just leave him over there. But Andrews Pete is always the man the Saints slide around. He played guard, then you kick him out the tackle, and then everybody expect the man to be an all-pro tackle. Don't work that way. He probably would have been an all-pro tackle if you left him there. I mean, he was damn near a pro bowl guard uh, two years back-to-back. 
You know, he played in the playoffs with a busted hand, and people was riding him hard then. I was like, damn, I just don't. Andrews Pete, to me, man, if you if they just leave him alone and sign and bring somebody that can play the tackle position, you know, he would develop into a solid player. You know, he's a solid player now, but he'll go, he'll take it up to the next level. Face Way said, who will keep this year's clap? Who who will we keep this year? Clap or time? Who you got, Q? Will clap or Cameron Tom? Hmm. Good question, Face Way. Well, you got Cameron Tom from Southern Miss. You got Will Clap from LSU. Will can play center and guard. So can Cameron Tom. I think Cameron Tom has the edge over over um, Will Clap. I just a lot of people slipping on Cameron Tom, man. They really are. Cameron Tom is a good offensive lineman. Really good. It's just unfortunate that when Will well, well, Max Unger retired, the Saints didn't say we got a future. We got we got Clap and Tom that could step up and make something happen. They immediately just went and signed this other guy, Nick uh, Nick Easton, who's not even a good center. He's more of a guard than he is center. And then he then he went a step further by drafting in the second round Eric McCoy, who should have been a first rounder, by the way. He should have been a guy that went in the first round. You got McCoy, who's the future center. So if if you force me to take a face way, if you if you force say Q, which, which one you got? I got I'm gonna have to ride with Cameron Tom, man. You know, I got to ride with Cameron because Cameron is good. They are really sleeping on Cameron Tom. I'm being honest with you. Not saying Will Clapp is not in, you know, it's not good, but Cameron Tom is very good. He's a good offensive lineman. And I think he's one of the most slept on, slept on players on this team is Cameron Tom. Oh, yeah. So I would take Cameron Tom face way. That's who I got. Ronald said you keep both those guys as staples right now. You know what? If you look at the depth chart, let me pull it because I got it right here, fam. Let's go over it. I'm going to pull up the depth chart right now. And I like to keep it on so I can bounce around and, and, and look at some of the players. But if you look at it right now, according to this depth chart, you can follow along with me on ourlads.com. I'm going to put the link in the descri- in the uh, in the chat, and y'all can feel free to go there. So y'all pay attention to the chat. I'm putting it out there. Hold on here. All right, something happened here. Okay, so, uh, no, it's not allowing me to chat it out. I don't know if y'all can see that. Can y'all guys see that there? Anybody see that link I just sent out? Let me know. Yeah, let me know if y'all can see that link I set out. If not, um, it's ourlads.com, www.ourlads.com, depth charts, and you go to New Orleans. And you can, it's probably one of the more accurate of the current depth charts that you can see. I got everybody there. This is what I usually follow. Y'all let me know if y'all uh, found it. If y'all made it to it, I'm going to go down it. I'm looking at the offensive line where it's listing that Will Clapp as an offensive, uh, as a guard back behind Andrews Pete. And you got um, Cameron Tom as a center prospect. Of course, Will Clapp and Tam and Tom could both play guard or center positions. Now, y'all got to remember now, they did bring in, um, in the, as far as the guards are concerned, Ryan Groy. Remember, he used to play for Buffalo. He's a veteran offensive lineman. The, the Saints brought him in here. Then there's still Marcus Henry, John Ulrich, Derek Kelly II, which is an undrafted guy. And, and yeah, then, of course, you got practice squad player Nate Wozniak, who's at tackle. Ethan Greenrich, undrafted guy. You got Michael Ola, who could play tackle or guard. Now, Michael Ola really stepped up last year, too. I didn't like what he looked like in, in camp, but – you, it could be very well stated that, man, yes, indeed, you know, you could actually keep both of those guys. Ronald's right. 
you can actually keep uh, both Will Clapp and Cameron Tom because both of those guys, the Saints always love versatility in their offensive linemen. And if you can got a guy that could play center or guard, that's a plus. That's a big time plus, you know. You know, so yeah, I have to. Face Way said, "Heard on WW Clap that uh, WWL that the clap is looking good this year." Well, Will Clap, man, I mean, he went the seventh round when the Saints drafted him. A lot of people anticipated him going like in the fourth or fifth round. They were surprised that he went that far down in the draft, being that he had all that playing experience at LSU. You know, and the fact that he was as versatile as as he was. I think Saints got to play with Will Clapp, no doubt about it. I mean, he's from the area. He's from down here. He went locally, played at LSU, and they come back and get drafted by the Saints. I mean, you couldn't write a better football story about uh, if you're from New Orleans or from the area. I think he's from Metairie. But write a better story. Kid from Metairie goes to LSU, gets drafted by New Orleans, his hometown team, you know. You can't write, like I said, you can't write a better story than that. But I wouldn't be upset if they kept both of those guys. You're right. They could, you, both of them could play center and guard, and you can definitely use them in the, in the pinch. Yeah, yeah. From the old line coach, they've been telling me. That's what I've been saying about Tom. Tom is really good, dude. He's really good. He's really good. And Will Clapp is stepping up because you know the competition between those guys, man, you know, to, to seize the day. But it brings the question, if those guys are as good as they say they are, why would you need to go out and get Nick Easton and spend all that money on Easton? Why would you get Easton? If Cameron Tom is as good as that and then you got Will Clapp behind him and you got Michael Ola, who the team was higher on as well, why would you need to go and get Nick Easton? Why? And then give him all that money when you know you're going to have to take that money and shift it to pay more important players. Not saying that these guys aren't important, but I'm saying guys that make stuff happen, you know, not role players. I'm t- talking about superstar talent. You got to pay Kamara in a little bit. You got to play Michael Thomas. You got to pay him Mike Thomas in a little bit. You know, you're going to have to pay Lattimore in a little bit. You know, so you're going to have to play some of your staples, you know, the star staples of your team. And you would get away with having good quality play from players like a Cameron Tom or like a, uh, a Will Clapp. You know, why would you go that route and get Easton? And I've often said the Saints could do it all over again. They would not have signed Nick Easton if they'd known Eric McCoy was sitting there in the second round waiting for him. I tell you that much. You know, I don't see where he fits. It's like I, I don't, I just don't get that part. Unless they anticipate not signing Will Clap, which I mean not Will Clap, uh, Andrews Pete. You know, he, he has he's one year left on his deal. This is it. And unless the Saints anticipate not bringing. Andrews Pete back, then you got Nick Easton to take his place. And I'm thinking that's probably what it is. Not probably exactly what it is. But yes, that's the interesting takes on that, fellas. Um, it says, uh, Chad says, Rashad Matthews was a top 25 receiver catching passes with the Titans. Was a top 25 receiver catching passes with the Titans. Yes. Yeah, I agree with you, man. I think the guy's going to be excellent. Lionel says, love the O-line. Pete been injury prone. Interesting who will start at center. Great depth. Saints got solid depth this year. Solid depth and guys that can play multiple positions. You know, Ola can play guard or tackle. Then you got Newhouse. Now, Newhouse is the interesting thing. Newhouse is going to be the key to that whole matrix. I don't think the Saints are going to get rid of Newhouse. I think they brought him in here because they needed a veteran offensive lineman that can step in in a pinch and do something for you so you don't have to tear up your offensive line. But then again, you bring Nick Easton in, who's the high, your highest paid uh, backup guard or offensive lineman, who's not going to start over Eric McCoy. And if he does start over Eric McCoy, it's because McCoy is not picking it up fast enough. But I guarantee you, at some point of the season, McCoy is going to take the job from him, if, 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 if that's the case. But my perspective is, the way he's rent, they're getting rent roots from McCoy, is that McCoy is going to step up in the capacity and end up seizing the position from the get-go. If that's the case, then Andrews Pete, definitely a guy that's looking on the way out, even though I would be like, you know what? Saints not going to pay Andrews Pete. You know, somebody else will, though. I ain't going to lie to you. The guy plays guard or tackle. They got teams that are hand over, fork over a truckload of money for a guy that can do that. 
Dada agrees. He says they probably not bring back Pete Easton slide on next year to start. Yeah, he's going to slide Easton in the guard position. Hopefully be any good, man. From the tape I seen on Easton, I wasn't impressed. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you. I think he just was a guy that got paid. at the, He was at the right place at the right time. That's that's my perspective on Andrews Pete. Jason King says Easton was a knee jerk. Oh, my God, our great center just retired. What are we going to do now, son? You know what? That that probably is the case because I remember the reports. Remember, he was here before you heard Max Unger retire, before it came out. They had him on the tryout. They came, they brought him down, but they because they already knew before they released the information to the public that Max told them, listen, I'm going to retire. I can't beat these injuries, and I'm, I'm going to just turn it in. They say, oh, man, we didn't, what we got out here to look for? We ain't got no such certainty. They should have turned around, looked at Will Clapp, said, and Cameron Thomas said, hey, y'all ready to play? And that's what it should have been. We should have kept Easton out of here. But they didn't. They gave Easton a boatload of bread to come in and be a whatever he's going to be, a backup guard, because he's not going to take nobody's job unless they hurt. He'll start for him while they, like, Lawarford's hurt right now, so he's going to be in his position. But, yeah, it was a knee-jerk reaction. I think that if they were, if if they had an opportunity to do it all over again, they probably would pull that money back from Easton. But they stuck with him now. So, yeah, I agree with you that, Jason. Yes, sir, fam. Let's keep it rolling, man. The questions were Rashard Matthews versus Cameron Meredith. We had a lot of answers with them. Uh, who do you like behind Davenport and um, Cam Jordan? Who do you like? Is it Corbin Kafusi? Is it uh, Shy Tuttle, Sylvester Tuttle is his whole name. Who do you guys like as the third pass rusher? Will, 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 Wes Horton, Wes Horton. And then, of course, the insurance and offensive line. We just got you going over that. And had a nice discussion on backup offensive lineman, uh, Marshall Newhouse, who the Saints brought on to be a veteran tackle, uh, just in case Teron Armstead has an oopsie and has to miss a few games. Then, of course, a, a real animated conversation we like to talk about is the QB of the future. Let's let's hash that one out, fam. We talked about it. Let's get some let's get some takes on those two. The QB of the future is he in the building? You know, answer that question. We got Teddy B, seventeen million dollar man, or Taysom Hill, the two hundred three hundred thousand dollar man. <laughs> I don't know. Is he, is the QB of the future in the building, man? You know, with New Orleans. And of course, the other, the final question and comment is Kayvon Webster's impact. What would Kayvon Webster bring, man, to our secondary? Y'all, y'all answer that great question. Tell me what you th- guys think about Kayvon Webster's impact to the Saints secondary. What does it mean to have a guy like Kayvon Webster? Like I said, as always, man, <clears throat> keep keep it going. Keep the questions and comments going. Any concerns that you have, you can lay them out in the chat, or you can hit us up here. 504-475-4482. Talk to me live on air on the live stream right now. Whatever questions you guys have, whatever co- questions, concerns, or comments that you want to hash out there about the Saints, about the Pelicans, about boxing. You know, we talk about all that great stuff here at the PRO Media Network, Sports Coma. Whatever it is, hash it out, fam. We got about another 20 minutes or so on air. Uh, before we ha- before in the live screen, so let's get it out there. Uh, Face Way says Teddy B can do it. He's no dree- breeze, but he's a quality starter. Okay, okay. He says Teddy B can do it. He's no breeze, but he's a quality. He is a quality starter. Seventeen million dollars. Uh, he he is obviously he's interested because the Miami Dolphins was giving him multiple years and uh, and more money to come and be their starting quarterback. That's what the Dolphins was offering Teddy Bridgewater, and he said, no, I'm going to stay back here with New Orleans and learn from Drew Brees, a Hall of Famer, take my time, and and might I add, get even more healthier, learn the system even further, and by next year, he'll have, what, three years in the Saints offense with Teddy Bridgewater? He should be all right, man. I think it would have took Aaron Rodgers four years. He sat behind Brett Favre before he just came in and just ran right past his legacy. Super Bowls, breaking records. Aaron Rodgers is awesome, man. Aaron Rodgers is awesome. 
you know, but Teddy Bridgewater, it could be an Aaron Rodgers type scenario. He'll sit behind Drew for this year, going into next year, maybe third year, take over. Of course, we still don't know exactly what's going to happen with Drew Brees now. He still feels that he could play at a high level. And as long as he continues to say that and show that, you don't run Drew Brees off. Do not run him off. Do not run Drew off. But the, the question is, which one of these guys do you like? Which is the QB of the future? He, do we Is he in the building or he ain't? we, we, we haven't seen him yet? <laughs> Yeah, see, Jason said, I wasn't with, impressed with Teddy start last year. I feel Taysom could have won us that game. Hill is definitely more exciting. Yeah, I think so, too, because of that, because the, the, the duality of it, I guess I can say, the versatility of Taysom Hill. I mean, he's faster. He's faster than most defensive backs. I mean, you've seen and tape him outrunning DBs. So he definitely presents an option of danger that you got to spy him. And as long as you got to spy him, that's one less guy that got us that's in a defense that's covering another guy and even double another guy. So if you got a guy that's prone to run and he he would get if he would get five or six yards on you every time, you got to spy him. It's just his accuracy is the thing that always been the knock on Taysom. And Taysom has been getting better passing that ball. But the thing is, too, Bridgewater does nothing else but just sits in the QB room. He's not in the special teams room like Taysom Hill. Taysom is learning special teams out there making tackles, blocking punts, you know, fake punt passes, all this fake, you know, all this kind of stuff. He's in the QB room. Will that affect his knowledge of the, I mean, in the special teams room? Will that affect his, his uh, maturation as far as a quarterback is concerned? Talk to me. That's, you know what? That's actually an excellent question. You know, I thought about that before. I was like, man, you know, with the Andrews Pete situation, people don't think about that. It's like, oh, Andrews Pete, garbage, Q. Yeah, oh, he just garbage, man. We need to get him out of here. I'm like, man, did you think for a second that they forced that man to play right guard, then left guard? Then every time Teron Armstead gets hurt, they kick him out the left tackle, and he gets hurt a lot. Armstead gets hurt a lot every year for the last several seasons. He's missed games. And guess who's out there playing? Andrews Pete playing his position. If they had left him alone, the guy would have been every bit of, of a pro bowler. Uh, as you can get, he would have mastered that position. He had all the size, skill, and intelligence to do it. He just, they jerked him around from position to position. Is that the same thing with Taysom Hill? Is that the Andrews Pete effect? Let's say that the Andrews Pete effect. Is, is Taysom Hill suffering from the Andrews Pete effect? And that means it, or it, just because he's participating on special team, is that, is that affecting his development as a quarterback? because he's out there blocking kicks and punts and throwing fake punt and all this kind of stuff reverses. And is this, is this affecting his quarterback play? Answer that fam. That's an interesting question. I want to know what y'all guys think about that one. Is, is Taysom Hill suffering from the Andrews Pete effect? You know, is he suffering from it? Is that, is that which is that stopping his development? Dada says, I feel one game doesn't show really what a QB can do. It's not fair. It's not far after one game to diss the man. That's true. You need multiple outings, but he had a terrible out, man. You know what they say about first impressions, J uh, Dada? You know what they say about first impressions? That wasn't a good first impression. That's why people feel the way about him that they do. That wasn't a good impression. You had all that time. That was the the last game of the season. That was the last game of the season. Last game. Wasn't like the first game where he had to. I mean, he should have had a way better out. Now he looked slow. He looked scared. He looked unsure. That wasn't Teddy Bridgewater. I remember. Even as a rookie with Minnesota, he played better than that. You know, and I was like, who is this guy? Who the hell is this guy? You know? You know, Lionel says QB favor of, of Tampa Bay, but of TB QB favor of TB. But are we changing offense due to arm strength of Drew Brees? Are we changing the offense in favor? He'll gives ver the, uh, diversity, but lacks accuracy. He does. That's the knock. 
But what if he's improving his accuracy? Then what happens there? What happens that, Lionel? If Taysom Hill improves his accuracy, what happens then? For all Saints people that haven't chimed in on the chat, please holler at us. Let us know where you caught, where you are chatting from, what area of the country are you. Uh, last chat, we had guys from Australia. We had guys from Texas chime in. You know, where are you guys chatting from? Hit us up here on this fine Saturday. Let us know where you guys are chatting from with the sports coma. And if you're not a subscriber, let me take this time to kind of uh, – Brian, what's what's up, Brian? Brian says in what's that, California somewhere? In Dio, California. Okay, it must be probably nice out there, huh? Probably beautiful. You're around a lot of water. You know, a lot of bathing suits and stuff like that. Sound nice, Brian. Welcome to the show, buddy. Um, let me take this time to say if you're not a subscriber, please hit the subscribe button. Please hit the thumbs up button as well. Please hit the notification buttons for future shows. And also know that we are, are you welcome, Brian? We are a, we cover the Saints. We die hard black and gold, but we also, if you are, if you are a New Orleans Pelicans fan and you like the Pelicans, we do have a podcast uh, called the Pelican Post Game Report that we've been doing for several seasons. It was born out of the sports coma. The sports coma used to be a podcast that covered it all. We did it all. We talked about the Saints. We talked about the Tigers. We talked LSU Tigers. We talked about the Pelicans. And we talked about boxing. That was our loves. All that was our sporting loves. And we covered all that out. Just one podcast. Ultimately, they grew into several different podcasts covering those things individually. If you are a New Orleans Pelicans fan, you can follow us doing the Pelican podcast and live streams on the P- the Pelican Post Game Report on YouTube. So you guys can you can put that in the YouTube search when you get an opportunity and subscribe to follow more content with the Pelicans. And it's going to get exciting this year, man. Zion Williamson, AD, getting traded up out of here. All that kind of great stuff. We cover it all, man. We talk about it all. We as passionate about the Pelicans as we as passionate as the New Orleans Saints and everything else. So if you're an LSU Tigers fan, if you like the Tigers, we also have podcasts called the T- Tough Tiger Talk, which is also on YouTube. And boxing show is called Ring Kings Boxing World, which we talk about all the latest fights later on this uh, to to a week couple podcasts covering all the latest boxing events in the boxing world. So if you haven't already hit the subscribe button, subscribe, hit the notification button and uh, the like button, the thumbs up button. Now, let's get back into our Saints discussion. Jason says, no doubt Q Hill is the Swiss Army knife. And I, I like that term, by the way. And he definitely hinders his ability at QB. He'll love to see him at tight end, too, with that speed. You know what? That's what I was saying. You know, we it, that's the thing. You know, Sean Payton got to know that if he considers Taysom Hill his, back, his future quarterback, you know, you got to value his health. Because what future quarterback you know you got playing special teams making tackles? You know? How many quarterbacks you know playing special teams, period? Taysom Hill probably, he is the only one in the pros that's doing that kind of stuff. So if you really think of Taysom Hill supposed to be a guy that's a future QB, I would be kind of mindful of watching him in those things. Special teams is probably one of the more dangerous areas that you could play. In sports, you got guys running all the way from one another and then running, slamming into you and you doing that. And he's crazy. He loves it. You can see Taysom Hill loves it. He just loves being on the field. But I can see the same strategies that they're employing and putting Taysom out there because, you know, of what he brings, his his the what is unpredictability of Taysom Hill. You know, he could throw the deep pass when yeah, his accuracy is something that he just has to work on. But every he has the kid has everything else. I mean, he has everything else. He has a killer arm. Do y'all realize that Taysom Hill has a great arm? You know, do people realize that he can throw the deep bomb? Remember that pass when he dropped it to Elvin Kamara and it went just flew right over his hand? That guy can throw the D. He has a hell of an arm. Taysom Hill has a hell of an arm. And he has been working on his accuracy. But there's only so much you can do if you're a guy that they have in the special teams room and you're trying to do all this stuff with special teams to when you got time to work on your QB, uh, improving yourself as a passer. That's something that's probably going to have to happen on his own time. You know, but you got Drew Brees out there, one of the more accurate, if not the most accurate quarterback in NFL history as a as a study. You study Drew, do what Drew do. 
you can't tell me that Taysom Hill being on this team didn't benefit at least improving his accuracy, maybe five to ten percent with Drew Brees as the quote, uh, just next to him, telling him you got to do this, Taysom. You know, you can't. That's like me saying that Traquan Smith won't benefit the least from working next to Mike Thomas, and Mike Thomas is set to be one of the best uh, wide receivers in the history of the game. Come on. He gonna benefit some kind of way, like Jerry Rice, like Jason Taylor benefited from having Jerry Rice on the other side. They gonna benefit. He gonna benefit. Okay, let's get to the more questions here. Kevin Smith, what's up, Kevin? He says, can't wait to see the Saints. Okay, Kevin Smith says, currently in Jacksonville, Florida, in Holly Grove. Okay, all right, all right, you way out there, brother. But that's a nice place to be around this time in Jacksonville, Florida, man. Uh, thank you for joining the show, there, Kevin. Uh, Jason says, oh, yeah, Drew was all that in San Diego. Why you think we wanted them even with a bum shoulder? That's right. And we made a good charge. That was a good charge there. Phase waste. I'm ch- chatting from the enemy territory in Atlanta, a.k.a. Haterville. <laughs> you know what, man? Atlanta's a great town, man. And they got a lot of great sites in Atlanta. It ain't the red, but you're, you're definitely in enemy territory. But I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something, friend. That when we kick their butts, you can. It's a great place to be because they get real quiet, and that's the great. They can't. That's beautiful, you know. So it's good there. That uh, Kevin said, "Can't wait to see the Saints in Jacksonville this season." Yeah, that that's gonna be a game. You know, Jacksonville got all that defense, and they got that quarterback now. It's gonna be a really serious game. Now, can't wait to see that one too. Really good game. Lionel says, "Hill development is crucial to the future, but we're comfortable with Teddy." His shows mental lapses, afraid to step up in the pocket. Yeah, that's because of that knee. You know, you know, that's that mental. That's that part of that psychological thing we talked about. Putting weight on that knee, doing that microfracture surgery, and to be honest with you, they told that man your career is over. Go back and look it up when he had that in, that injury. If it wasn't for the technology, man, we have today, Bridgewater's career would have been over. He wouldn't have not been playing football. It was over. So it's a psychological advantage, uh, edge in rehabilitating. It's not just rehabilitating the, the mind, the body. It's also the mind. And if you don't, and even if the leg is totally healed, what 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 benefits that mentally if your mind is not there? You know, it's like it's it's it might as well not. It might as well still be injured if you not if you don't know it's one hundred percent full. You see what I'm saying? So a lot of times we chalk it up. We say. That is the guy's physically ready, but mentally, it's a it's a rehabilitation process mentally first, because a man has to undergo the long rehabilitation process, which starts mentally, and everything starts mentally, and then it spans out to spiritual and physical and everything else like that. There, but see, that's what it comes down to. Teddy Bridgewater not looking comfortable, and we've seen that in the Carolina game. Unlike what I've seen in Minnesota games, when he never had those type of injuries. So that is the thing. You know, we were able to take a quarterback who some said could never be anything. Remember what they were saying about Drew after that shoulder surgery, when he got that shoulder tore up in San Diego trying to dive for that fumble under that pile. He got his shoulder tore up. People's like, no, Drew Brees will never be the same. What did he do? He had a better second half of his career than he ever had of the first round. He was a good quarterback with San Diego, but not nearly a Hall of Famer. He became a Hall of Famer when he made it down here and teamed up with Sean Payton, you know. And maybe the Saints could strike gold again with Teddy Bridgewater, but this time not so much the shoulder, but with that leg. Maybe they can kind of strike or say, well, listen, it's the same kind of process. Real sim- eerily similar because Sean Payton was interested in drafting Bridgewater when he was in the draft. I remember Sean Payton talking about that, but then getting the guy over with. Now, Drew like Drew came through with his shoulder and had an excellent career. Could we expect the same from Teddy Bridgewater with his, with his leg? You know, he has all of the particulars. Only thing he has to do is just keep immersing himself in this in this quarterback friendly offense. Remember Luke McCown? McCown came out through that 400 yards against Carolina. We lost the game, but it just shows you that even a backup quarterback who has a grasp of the system could could run this offense. Not taking nothing away from Drew, but it's a quarterback friendly system. And if you're a veteran quarterback, that's capable of understanding the nuances of the system and knowing what to do. You should have success in the system. It's just that Drew Brees mastered the system where he can run this system in his sleep. 
And remember, he's been in the system for for several years, so for many years, so he knows it backwards and forwards. I dare say he probably know the system almost better than Sean Payton, you know. And it's very rare you get guys that you, that stick together for that long duration, that work together, that understand what they want. Like Sean, a call for play, and then Drew would wave it off and say, "Nah, Sean, it ain't gonna work. I got the play." They run a play, and Sean said, "You know what? That play worked better than the play I was going to do." You know, I've said, I'm pretty sure they do that all the time. Space with some chatting from it. Wait, hold on. Uh, let's see. Lionel says heel development. We already read that one. Dada said, I was saying from the start in his first season, he wasn't that wide. The draft, uh, they drafted Rivers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. He wasn't all that. They were looking. Remember, he was a second round draft pick. Uh, LaDainian Tomlinson, I think, was the first round of that year, and they got Drew, and he played that way. But they definitely were looking kind of to move Drew out of there because they, I think they had that mindset they wanted the big quarterback. You know, at that mindset, the big quarterback, the traditional NFL quarterback, 6'4", 6'5", big guy, stand tall in the pocket and deliver the ball. Drew Brees didn't fit that. He was a six-foot quarterback throwing in between passing lanes. You know, and that wasn't ideal to what they were looking for. They wanted the big mammoth quarterback like Philip Rivers, 6'5", 6'6", guy, standing tall, throwing over 6'5", 6'6", offensive lineman. And and because of that, they decided when he got hurt, they kind of unceremoniously marched him out of San Diego. But, you know, I thank them because without them thinking like that, we wouldn't have had Drew and we didn't got a Super Bowl with Drew, you know, and it was an excellent move. I, I I think it was John. Dada says none. Hill ain't no QB doing none. Hill ain't no QB doing special teams. Okay. Jason King says Hill reminds me of Stewart from Pittsburgh back in the day from Cardell Stewart. Yes. Does he? I think Cardell was a more accurate passer of the ball than him, but he do. I mean, they share commonalities. You know, they got the ability to scramble and move around in the pocket and you know, they can do different things. You know, how about Antoine randall L? Would that be more of a fair comparison than Cardell Stewart? What do you think about that? What do you think about that, Jason? But Antoine randall L, who was a quarterback in college, would that be a more even? But Antoine randall L was actually pretty accurate, too. You know, and he just changed position. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, Jason agrees. I think that probably would be a better, better fit. Hill is the white Michael Vick before prison. <laughs> no accuracy throwing, but still exciting as hell. I mean, you know what, man, Vic, Vic didn't get, he got that nine accuracy charge, but Michael Vick wasn't a bad accurate quarterback for his career. You know, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pull up Mike Vick's stack right now and I'll prove it to you what his accuracy was on. Uh, let's see. Let's pull up Michael Vick. Pull it up for you and show you something, friend. Okay, you got Michael Vick, and we're gonna see what his his accuracy is for his career. Let's how about that? Might surprise you. It might surprise you. Let's pull him up here and see what he's dealing with. Okay. Let's see. Mike Vick's accuracy. Uh, let's see. Completion percentage for his career. Okay, 56%, 56%, 56% passing accuracy on a completion percentage, okay? Now, he missed, not 07 and 08, he missed the years for violating the league's personal conduct policy. Then he came back with Philly. He played like five years with Philly, one year with the Jets, and then Pittsburgh one year. But his career percentage, uh, pa- uh, completion percentage, fifty six percent. His time with Atlanta was fifty four percent, and his years with Philly, believe it or not, was fifty nine point five percent. So how about that? Almost sixty percent for Michael Vick with his Philly years after his Atlanta years. So see, sixty percent passer. So that's not bad. That's not bad. Actually, that's damn good. That's pretty good. And that's surprising because I thought it was a lot less than that. But see, I was like, it's, it'll show you that, you know, it'll surprise you, man. It'll surprise you how some of these guys is. 
All right, fam, we're going to do one more round of uh, topics before we call it a wrap on our live stream. Uh, chime in comments, concerns, or questions. We got Rashad Matthews and Cameron Meredith. Who do you guys like out to win that one? Who's the best pass rusher uh, behind Davenport and Cam Jordan? Who do you like as an insurance policy on the offensive line? Uh, do you like uh, Marshall Newhouse? You know, Andres Peter was mentioned, you know, uh, Q QB of the future thoughts. Y'all guys chimed in on that. And of course, the last one is called Kayvon Webster. What is his impact going to be? Of course, Saint signed Kayvon Webster, uh, seven, eighth year veteran, uh, played with the Denver Broncos, the Los Angeles Rams and other teams. Saints brought him aboard for basically a one year deal uh, to improve the experience of the secondary what do you guys think about that? What do you guys think about the Kevon Webster's impact on the team? I've made my statement about it. I think Kevon Webster would be an awesome addition because I like the fact that he provides a veteran experience behind Patrick Robinson, who is coming off a broken ankle. And we also have a lot of hate for Eli Apple. Just like it's like the same. It's them two guys. It's, it's Andrews Pete and Eli Apple. They, I need to send a bill to them because I feel like the lawyer protecting them. You know, I got to send a bill to them or something because Andrews Pete is a guy that they keep talking about. Everybody's mentioned like, man, look, hey, Andrews Pete is garbage. And Eli Apple, oh, man, he's terrible, Q. Eli Apple's terrible. I was like, fam, Eli Apple been here a half a year. You know, could we give him a full year before we land based him? You know, he didn't do all that bad. It's just that you got to remember who he's playing on the other side of. You're going to be throwing. You're not throwing to that guy over there. So all that's coming your way. And he's been here a half of year. Imagine if he was here at the start of, pre, at start of the season and learned everything. He would have been a lot better. That's why I'm saying we have to be able to we got to be able to be patient with guys like Eli Apple and Andrews Pete being at this shift and Andrews Pete all the way around. There's no other player on the Saints team that get done like Andrews Pete. I mean, seriously, they get done like Andrews, Andrews Pete get done. Oh, we're going to move him over here, over there, and then throw him out there when Andrew, Taron Armstead. But we don't blast Taron Armstead for getting hurt as much. I'm missing all them damn games, but we'll blast Andrews Pete. That's what I'm saying. We got to we got to think about that family. Jason says, I, Q, I still think we draft the QB next year. Could be they got a, quite a few of them that'll be available. But uh, we don't have a set a first round draft pick next year, do we? Do we? Did we give up our first rounder? See, I'll be forgetting, man. Did the Saints give up their first round draft pick? next year i think we do got a first round pick i think we gave up our second round pick you know so it could very well be you know we got some decent quarterbacks coming out next year but if we if we want to be in the super bowl we ain't gonna get hold to none of them <laughs> we ain't gonna be able to get a, a franchise guy you know if we a super bowl team and i'm hoping we be a super bowl team we're gonna get the last pick in that round so you know it might not be the case okay Lionel says we do have it. I think we gave up our second round draft pick. Yeah, we have number one next year, but I think we gave up our second round pick uh, next year. I think that's what it was. Faceway said if Webster's healthy, he should be good for us. Yes, he's healthy. He's healthy. He is healthy, and I, that's why I'm excited. I like that. Dada says Eli Apple is the best number two we've had in a while. P.J. Crawley was crap. Absolutely agree with you there, Dada. Absolutely, I agree with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because P.J. Williams is just plum. He's physical. He could tackle, but he can't cover. And Crawley is just no confidence. He grabs the man and holds the man. And I'm like, what are you doing, man? You know, what, what's wrong with you? You can't. Go out there and just wrap your arm around the man and run with him down the field like that. The fool, that's a that's a penalty. That's a penalty. You can't do that. Well, why not, Q? Because it's illegal. You can't do it. It's against the rules. Well, okay, all right. 
They go out there and do it the next time. It's like I'm saying, man, why, why, you know, why? I agree with you on that, though, Jason. Apple is the best number two we've had in a while. Think about your number twos that you had in a while. You just mentioned PJ and Ken Crawley. But Apple's a former first-round draft pick out of Ohio State. He had some pretty good years with the Giants. Played a half a season with the Saints. A half a season. Let's see what he looks like in a full season. And you can't get him for being injured because the guy is 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 is, is, is available and playing. He got good size, good speed. I think he'll be fine, man. I'd be like, I, 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 like I said, this secondary to me is increasing. Then you throw a uh, Chancey Gardner Johnson in the mixture. You know what he gonna do in the third? Nickel package, the third, you know, three nickel package plays, you know, in a, in a, as that third safety. Saints got to see them employing them in them capacity. So it's really exciting to see what the secondary is focusing what it's lining up to be. Really love it and like it big time. Dada says, You're right, Q. We treat Pete bad and Armstead can't play 10 straight games, but nobody never says nothing. I, you said it. You said it, friend. You said it and I said it. We don't, we don't. We don't lamb base Teron Armstead. Nobody talks about Teron Armstead missing all them games, but we'll hang Petrus, uh, Andrews Pete out to dry every time and call him garbage and trash and say we need to get rid of him. If anybody earned a contract, it's Andrews Pete, to be quite honest with you. I mean, the guy played three positions for you. He could play left guard, right guard, and tackle. And I'm pretty sure if you move him to right tackle, he could play that too. You haven't done anybody like that. And if anybody deserve a contract, it's him. You know, take Nick Easton's money and pay it to Andrews Pete. You'll get more bang for your buck. I promise you that. Jason says, Crawley got to go, man. Simple as that. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. He's going to walk himself right up off here. But you don't have much behind him. That's the thing that saved me. I had Justin Hardy that plays special teams, but was trying to learn the cornerback position. Remember, Hardy is a former wide receiver. So he's trying to learn the cornerback position, and he works, for Latim- works with Lattimore, and he's getting better. He's a guy that a lot of people are not talking about because he's not known to be a decent cornerback. Even though it's cornerback by trade, he makes his bones in the special teams. He's very good at that. But it's the same thing with guys like Chris Banjo. Nobody wants to see Chris Banjo play safety if your safety gets hurt. But you love him out there on the special team. The only guy I said I feel like that is with Craig Robinson. If somebody, God forbid, one of our top three linebackers suffer an injury and Craig Robinson out there, I feel good about that. I love Craig Robinson. But when it come down to Chris Banjo and Justin Hardy, I got love for those guys, but I don't want to see Justin Hardy out there starting for me at cornerback. I don't want to see uh, Chris Banjo out there starting for me at safety. I'm sorry. That's why the Saints drafted two safeties, Saquon Hampton and Chauncey Gardner-Johnson, you know, because they felt the way I felt. Like, oh, Chris Banjo, uh, wow, I don't think we could do, you know, what a guy like Johnson Gardner-Johnson could do. So. I mean, that's my take, my take on it. And Lloyd said, Lloyd Vaughn, what's up, Lloyd? Lloyd said, because Armstead is a better athlete and player at left tackle. Look up the PFF and see what they say about Pete compared to other linemen on the team. I, I see where you're coming from, Lloyd. But see, my my thing is, even if they got Armstead, and we had this on chat with the, the last time we had this on the live chat, we was talking about something similar to this. We was talking about, I don't know if it was Chad. Chad, was that you that we was having this conversation about um, Andrews Pete? Because the, the the whole deal with Andrews Pete and versus Eli and, uh, uh, and uh, Teron Armstead speaking about elite. Was that you, Chad? Who was saying that, uh, that uh, Armstead was elite? Was that you, Jason? Who was that saying that Armstead is elite? And I kept saying, if. Because we had that discussion before on a previous live stream about Armstead's best ability is not his speed, not his size, not his intelligence, but his availability. He got to be there. He's got to be there. What good is me having an elite offensive lineman if he never plays? You know, I mean, seriously, I, I feel where you're coming from, Lloyd. But I'm saying, I hear what PFF's saying about Armstead. But... You got to look at it. And I don't know if PFF looking like looking at it like that. They grading a man out at, at his position. But what would he look like if he didn't have to kick out to that elite offensive tackles position every time he got hurt? Well, you know what? 
instead of talking about it, let me pull up. How about that, fam? Let's do that. Let me show you Armstead's availability. Can we do that? Can we get this done? Can we talk about this and get this over with so I can prove to y'all exactly what I'm talking about, about Terron Armstead's availability? Because we need to go over this because people not understanding the fact that how many games Terron Armstead is missing and how that's impacting Andrews Pete's development. And you're like, well, how is that possible, Q? How do you say that the man is... He is it, how can Armstead impact Pete's development? Those are two different players. That don't make no sense, Q. It does if you think about it in terms of if Armstead gets hurt, who's the first person the Saints put at his position once he get once he hops off the field or drops on a little golf cart and drives to the back to get medical care? Who is the person that they put in his position? Do they put Michael Ola out there? Because somebody answer that question for me. Who is the first person that goes in the position that Teron Armstead vacates when he gets hurt? Who goes out there? The answer is Andrews Pete. And so I was, I will say in my mind, if Andrews Pete is able and allowed to stay at left guard where he plays and not move around, to left tackle, if Armstead gets hurt, wouldn't he be a better player? Wouldn't he be a better player? He'd be like, well, I don't know, Q. Well, take body like this then. Let me throw this in there. When Armstead moves out the left tackle, doesn't he play really well out there at left tackle? Doesn't he? If he didn't, they wouldn't move him out the left tackle. What's more important of a position, the left tackle position or the left guard position? Let's act. Let me answer you that. Let me ask that. Come on, Saints family. Chime in with me. Y'all know what I'm talking about. The question is, what's a more important position in terms of protecting a quarterback? Is it left tackle or left guard? Is it left guard or left tackle? Because if that's the case, if Andrews Pete is not as good as everybody's saying he is, why would you then take that a below average offensive lineman? That's the terms that people told me. That's not me saying that. I say he's above average and borderline pro bowler a few seasons ago. And I would have said that Pete would have been a pro bowler multiple seasons had it had not been for the fact that he had to go relieve Armstead's ass when he gets hurt. But think about it like this. If he was above average, why would Sean Payton take his, excuse me, below average? That's what a lot of people telling me. If he was below average, why would you take your below average ass offensive lineman guard and move him to left tackle, which is probably one of the most important positions to protect your quarterback if you didn't think he was good, if he was no good? See what I'm, see the point I'm raising here? We got to think about it. That's why I'm saying I'm not quick to dis, like, crap on Andrews Pete because I can I know what time it is when when Sean Payton was shifting him around when he first got out I was like man and then talking bad about him like oh he's not learning fast enough well goddamn Sean goddamn if the, he was a rookie and you moving around from left guard right guard tackle what you think is gonna be a learning curve Ryan Ramchek played left tackle for a little bit and then they say okay you, this is where you're gonna be and what right and Ramchek sitting up there almost a pro bowl offensive lineman Today, pro bowler, Ryan Ramchek. You know why? Because he can sit and stay at that position and learn it. You got Pete moving all the way around, and people not giving a man credit. And he got a feeling for Armstead. But let but I'm going to go to y'all questions, right? I'm going to read some of y'all comments in just a second. I love what y'all talk about there. Let me give you some insight on what I mean about Terron Armstead and his history. Now, Armstead, yep, Arkansas, Arkansas Pine Bluff, he come out of there. 6'5", 304 pounds, his career, according to Pro Football Reference, six games, 60 games he's played. 60 games he's played, he started in 56 games. Okay, now let's, let me see if I can get his, his number. of See, this man's miss. Look, the last, let me see here. All right, let's just go to last. Look, you can go, look, yeah, yeah see? Yeah. You can go all the way back to to 2014. 
to carry Armstead if you like. He played 14 games. That's the most games, y'all, that Armstead played. It was back in 24. It's 2019, man. It's 2019. He played 14 games and started 14 games back in 2014, man. Then the 2015, 13 games. He played and started 13 games. How many games is there in the NFL season, regular season? How many games is it again? Let's go on. 2016, he played, he started seven games, play, um, started seven and played in seven in 2016. Who filled in for him? In 2017, he played in 10 games and started 10 games. In 2018, he started in 10 games and played in 10 games. So, I mean, you had 10 games in 2018, 10 games in 2017, 7 games in 2016, 13 games in 2015, and 14 games in, in 2014. Come on. That's the stats. I hate to show you, but you would say, Q, you don't know what you're talking about. I have to break it. I got to break out the stat book and show y'all, man. That's what we, because we're going to stand on the truth, man. We got to stand on the truth. This ain't true here. Armstead is not there when he's supposed to be. The last couple of years, the last two seasons, he played in 20 games of the last two seasons. How many, how many games is there in the NFL regular season again, family? 16? Who had to cover his ass when he was gone the last couple of years since Andrews Pete been here? Come on now. Let's be real. You don't think for a second that that may have shifted up stopped Andrews from being as good as the offensive guard as he possibly can be because he's trying to learn another position and play a position that he didn't even play when he came out of college. He was a tackle that converted to be a pretty solid guard, and he would have been a pro bowler if they'd have left him alone. You know, let's read some of these comments here because y'all talking talking over here. Um, Jason says, CG, uh, uh, yeah, Chauncey Gardner Johnson is going to be a superstar. I agree with you on that. He said, it wasn't me. I love Tyron Armstead, but availability is the key word here. Yes, sir. Jason, I agree. Chad, chime in. He said, it wasn't me. <laughs> it wasn't me. It wasn't me. He said, it wasn't me. I love Tyron, but availability, that's Jason. He said, Chad said, it wasn't me. I think it is. I think he's elite, but I think our best O-lineman by far is Ram Check. Yeah. If you notice, our brightest, our uh, biggest runs are behind him. You're right. It is just because he ain't there. I mean, Armstead, if he was there, he would be the best offensive lineman. He would, but he's not there. Jason says he he Pete played with a broken hand last year. He plays hurt. How could you hate that man? How could you hate a man that plays with a busted hand? A busted man with a broken hand. I say you go to work doing whatever you do. And you got a broken hand. You going to go to work with a broken hand? Hell no, you ain't going to go to work with a broken hand. You ain't going to go to work with no broken hand. And if you go up there and show up to work with a broken hand, the people going to run and say, man, you can't come and help in here. Because if you hurt that hand, you're going to get workman's comp. And run you know what I mean? they, It's just not going to happen. It's the, and even if an environment where they allow you to work hurt, you know, most people wouldn't do it. And you got to give credit to what credits do because some guys – they wouldn't have played with a busted right hand. He played with a hand. Got to give, got to give Andrews Pete some respect. Let's stop calling them garbage without looking at all the facts that are involved. Is what I'm saying. You know, that's what we have to do. Armstead has to be on the field. Pete does a have a problem with speed rushers, but he also hurt last year and still played. That's what Chad say. Uh, Lloyd says Pete does, but I would prefer Ram check. Okay. Um, uh, the QB blitz blind side is supposed to be protected by their best tackle. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Thank you, man. Jason, appreciate it. The most important part on your offensive line and protecting the quarterback. Now we can talk about how important the center position is because if you don't have, if you have a shitty center, you're going to have problems in the interior. But when we talk about edge rushers, we talking about the NFL, the fast NFL. We talking about Von Miller. We talking about all these guys that's pretty decent pass rushers that's out there. You know, that's just will take your head off, running right past you. You got all you got linebackers. They convert into defensive ends and calling them DEs like Von Miller. Von Miller's a linebacker. 
and he got him as a defensive man. Then they added this Chubb guy next to him who's a pretty good pass rusher in his own right. So what I'm saying is the pressure is coming from the edges. Now, you might have guys that push the center, push the middle, but the key to it is you got to have offensive linemen. Big. These are big six foot seven, six foot six guys that's blocking these linebacker sized pass rushers who got wide, basically almost wide receiver speed from getting to your quarterback. So it's going to be an edge rusher. And if you got a right handed quarterback like who got Drew Brees, the blind side is over here. It's to his back. And if it's to his back, then it will be the left tackle position, correct? If he's a right handed quarterback, and he's holding the ball with the right hand. His back, his blind side is the left tackle. That's Armstead. So if Armstead gets hurt, Pete goes over there. So you mean to tell me a b- below average offensive lineman going to move from the guard position to your most important position and then perform. And then perform against these edge rushers. These same edge rushers I just told you about. Come on. Come on, yo. We got we got, we got to speak on it. That's That's that truth. Left tackle is more important, but Pete is a better guard because Pete latches on to big defensive tackles and it's over it. True. But at left tackle, Pete has trouble with speed, guys. Look at his college tape against uh, Nate O. You're right, Chad. You're right. But he's gotten a lot better since he came to the league. But my point is, if you allowed him to learn, like if he would have left him at tackle, Andrews Pete would have been a pretty decent tackle, pretty good tackle. Because he was a pretty damn good tackle in Stanford. But when you played at guard, this man never played guard before at any level. And he got in there, and it was a stretch of season where he was playing, where he was right up under damn near a pro bowl. He was damn near with all them years when the, most of them offensive line, when Unger, when Unger went there, and, and he was right there that close to being a pro bowl offensive lineman. He should have got it one of those years, but they snubbed him. But that's what I'm saying. How, if if that's the case, why do you not use your backup left tackle? Why are you taking your starting left guard and moving them to left tackle? Why not use your backup tackle to play, the back, you know, to move in the spot where your starting tackle gets hurt? You know, when he left out of there, backup tackle, come in, do his job. Why move Pete from his guard position left tackle? I'm just saying merely that that's affecting his uh, development at the guard position, that he could have been a pro bowler. That's just merely my commentary. That's and I'm and I'm sure. Then I just gave you the facts and matter about uh Taron Armstead and how many games he missed. I went down the last five years of games from Taron Armstead that he's missed. It's 16 games in the NFL regular season, correct? Well, the last two years he's played only 20 games. 20 games in two years. That's 10 games a year. So somebody got to be picking up that extra weight, and this Andrews P. Some credit has to be given to Andrews Pete and nine credit be given to a terror on Armstead. And you cannot say Armstead is elite because if it's the same argument I had the last live stream, when I said you can't call Drew Brees elite anymore, if he's missing, if he's missing half of his games due to injury, how is he still elite? He's not putting up the elite stats anymore. And we're not living off of past seasons here because each season is onto itself. So you might have Drew Brees. Let's say Drew Brees, God forbid, misses half the games this year. Is he still elite? No, he's not because he's not. He's missed half the games and he's not putting up. He can't. The stats will determine his elitism. Oh, Drew drew 40 touchdowns this year and 4,400 yards, you know. Oh, man, that's where it's at, you know. And uh, he's not going to make a Pro Bowl with a half a season, man. It's just He's not. you can't consider him elite. And the elite part about it, remember, like guys like Jonathan Ogden and other people like that, those guys, those big guys were elite because they played, man. They played. I know it's a tough position, but Armstead's only elite if he plays, if he can fight through injury and stay there and compete. And that's something that he has not done in the last several years. You got to take his credit away because he hadn't been there consistently and give it to the man that has. That's Andrews Pete. Come on. Let's give some, let's just give Andrews Pete some love, man. Come on. Come on, Saints fans. We got to give Andrews Pete some love, man. We got to stop all this hating on Andrews, man. He's doing his best out there. Let's see what else you guys. Pete catches the uh, catches hell, but the man plays hurt and tries hard. Thank you, Dada. That, that's where Chad says Pete is rare because here is so he's so versatile. He has lent like a tackle, but tree trunk legs like a guard. <laughs> oh, Lord. Thank you, man. Appreciate your gift, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your gift. 
I think Ram would be better future wise at left tackle. I think Ram would be okay at left tackle. That'd be interesting to move Ram check over to left tackle, wouldn't it? Yeah. But if you anticipate losing losing Andrews Pete and then Teron Armstead, I don't know when his contract is up. You know? You gotta start taking money away from Teron Armstead too. How are we gonna take Cameron Meredith's money? You know, how are you gonna take Cameron Meredith's money away and not consider taking Teron Armstead's money away? I, I don't get that one there, fellas. How are we letting this double standard exist here? Cameron do, doesn't see the field, but shit, does Tamaron Armstead does? Can we take some money back from Tyron Armstead? I mean, and give it to Andrews Pete. Can we at least do that? Jason says Ricky Jackson showed up to the play, showed up to play with a broken face. Yep. Different breed of players back then, though. They still got those old school throwback style players in today's leagues. They still do. You know, they still do. You got guys like what Andrews did, play with a broken hand. How many of them, you know, that did that? Oh, I can't play, man. My. My freaking hand broken. And you say, you know what? That's true. You can't play with a broken hand. But what Andrews Pete did went out there and played a pretty decent hand game with that broken hand. You got to get that man credit. Jason said, I learned that by watching the blind side about Michael, <laughs> Michael Orr. <laughs> uh, Chad, guard is very important in our offense. Our formula to beating us is pressure up the gut that mess up that messes up drew's trying lanes that's true edge guys rarely have success against us because drew gets rid of the ball quick that's right drew does help out the offensive line by being quick and decisive with the football drew goes through all progressions he looks scans the field and finds the best player that he could sometimes he'll just simply dump it off to elvin kamara who will take a one a yard dump off and turn it into eight nine yards be blessed to have those type of players that's elusive after the catch but you absolutely and most certainly right drew does get rid of the ball fast because he knows that's a that's a part of the process but in terms of being strong up front you're right the saints have done and remember the first game against the rams you know i studied that tape man because everybody was talking about how the rams interior with nadamik and sue and Aaron uh, Donald and uh, Big Michael Brockers, how they was going to give the Saints all kind of props. That first game, the Saints just dominated them. Dominated them. And the people's like, well, how the hell did the Saints' defensive, offensive line dominate the Rams' 3 4 defense? Well, it's three guys against five guys. And even though Aaron Donald's a beast, so is our offensive line. You know? You know, you could take one, two of our, one, uh, at least three of our offensive linemen, at least two of them, could take one of them guys on and, and guard them in a in a matchup one on one all day. But you got them chipping the other guy, and come on, you know, come on. You don't think Ryan Ramchek can hold his own against Michael Brockers? Well, you don't have to think about. It. Look at the tape; he sure did. So did Armstead and the rest of them. They held, they, 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 they got up for the challenge and showed them Rams, man. Y'all ain't gonna do nothing to my quarterback here. You can't do shit here. You know, and that's what happened. You know, but it's it's the Saints are un, very underrated. With Max Unger out, that the could Eric McCoy duplicate the success that Max Unger brought in, in the interior? And I think so. Because you watch footage on him at Texas. It's one thing Aaron uh, uh, Eric McCoy does is, and that is he's very fast and smart and technically sound. He pushes. He got he got a little mean streak with him. And I just, I mean, you couldn't have picked a more perfect replacement to take over for the next 10 years at the offensive mind. And Eric McCoy, he is the real McCoy. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Dada says you're right, Big Q. Armstead is basically overrated, in my opinion. Trade him next year for a QB of the future. I ain't going to say you're overrated, Dada. I wasn't saying that, brother. I was merely saying that he's not playing as much, so he has to give back that elite title until he can prove that he can play those a 16-game stretch. How are you an elite offensive lineman if you can't do an entire season? That's my point. That takes the varnish off that elite label. That's all I'm saying is that you can't consider yourself in as an elite offensive lineman 
if you're not playing. You know, that's that's just my point. I'm not saying he's overrated, but I do think for the production that he's given, you need to give some of that money back. Because if if because we trying to take Cameron Mer- saying why is Cameron Meredith, you know, Saints took his some of his money and told him, you know, we're gonna give you a reduction. Uh did Armstead get a reduction, y'all? Did he get a let me see, because I might be talking mess about him, but I don't remember hearing about Teron Armstead taking a pay cut. You know, I don't think so. I don't think so. You know, did he take a did he take a pay cut? I don't think so. I don't think he took a pay cut. He reworked his deal. November of November 7th. Okay, here we go. It says Saints reworked Tehran. See this one. I remember this one. November the 7th, 2018. It says this is from uh, 24-7 Sports. It says that uh, Saints reworked Tehran Armstead's deal to pay Des Bryant. Okay, remember that. And let me see, they restructured this contract. Armstead has 4.8 million of his original 10.2 million base salary for the season still remaining. They said, which will not be turned into a, which all of which will not be turned into a signing bonus to help relieve the same salary cap position and create financial space to sign Bryant to the Rops to the, the move will free up $3 million in cap space for the season, which in all likelihood will give the Saints enough capital to sign Des Bryant. Armstead has three years left on an existing contract. Under the former agreement, he was going to count for $15 million against the Saints' salary cap in each of the next two full seasons, a number that would increase to $12.75 million in 2021. Under the new agreement, that number will go up further still. This is not the first time the Saints have rearranged Armstead's contract. During the offseason last year, after they acquired five new players and re-signed others, the team converted $5 million of the players' salary for that year into a signing bonus. Armstead signed the contract back in 2016, five-year extension worth $65 million featuring guaranteed of $38 million and an $11 million signing bonus. Several months after signing the agreement, Armstead sustained a knee injury, keeping him from all but two of the Saints games that season, eventually landed him on the Injured reserve, he also dealt with the torn labor during last season's minicamp, but healed earlier than expected and started 10 games for the eventual NFC champions. Contract, Olmstead's contract features the largest cash payout this season, according to Spoiler Rack, which ranks his deal as the most expensive on the team, tied with that of Drew Brees. Now, there you go, fam. That's real-time information, isn't it? That he did take a pay cut in November and was part of the deal to sign Des Bryant. So, there you go. He did take a pay cut. But he said he's, that his contract in the future is still supposed to go high. I think it might be time for another pay cut if he can't step up. But he's still healthy, so we'll see what goes on, man. We'll see. They've been taking taking, and going to him saying, look, man, we got to take some of this money and convert it into a signing bonus. Okay, Dada says, use him to move up in the draft after a trade to focus on the QB. Lloyd says, you're tripping, Dada. Is Cameron as valuable to this team as Armstead? I digress. Yeah, is that that's a question? Is Cam, is Tyrone Armstead more is, is as important to the Saints team as Cam Jordan? Interesting. Cameron is way more important than Armstead because he's always available. <laughs> uh, Lloyd, you gonna have a hard time here, man. You're going to have a hard time here trying to convince people, man, about Terror and Armstead. I'm just going to be honest with you, man. You're going to have a hard time trying to convince people. Cameron is way more important than Armstead because he always is available. Dada nailed them on that one. Lloyd, Lloyd said Meredith, not big number 94. Dada, he should take a pay cut. You know the answer to that, Lloyd. Lloyd said they won't ask him, but they still value him. They do value Big Armstead, man. He took a pay cut last November. You know, according to the report I just read from 24-7 Sports, you know. But, you know, like I said, Armstead, the pressure is definitely on him, too. We got to look at Armstead. Can't have – now, I played an interview from Teron Armstead last year. Y'all can go back and listen to it Well, he spoke about it about him being healthy. Even one of the reporters said, man, this is the first time in a long time that you, we felt, you know, you were healthy. He made like a smirking gesture toward him. Like, and the man like, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Cause I'm here all the time. I'm seeing you. 
the first time in a long time you ain't in the training room or got ice all over you, you know. And and it is true. It's the first time in several seasons that Armstead is actually ready for big camp to go. The question is, can he remain that way? Can. And it's been, I've, I've ran the statistics down to you, fam. It's been over four years since he played a full season. You know? Doesn't that give you the injury-prone label? How many seasons do you have to, or games or that you have to miss before you finally start getting the injury prone label. You know, is isn't he is is Andrews Pete injury prone? Is he injury prone, fam? Is he? You know, I ain't gonna say injury prone yet, but he getting there. If anybody getting close to it, it's definitely him. Yeah, they do, but for now, much longer. Let him. Get hurt this year. This may be a wrap for him. Dada said, hell yeah, he injured prone Q. <laughs> oh, man. Y'all something else, man. Y'all something else. Well, fam, it's been terrific, man, sitting up here talking to y'all uh, on this beautiful Saturday, man. And uh, like I said, man, we do it every Saturday live stream, man. Feel free to chime in. Come in. Come in. We'll talk about Saints, Pelicans. Uh, look out soon. We'll have another sports coma uh, part podcast. If you guys are interested in and in signing up to listen to the live the podcast live, you can go to the link that I'm typing in right now, and uh, this it's the sport is Spreaker dot com slash the sports coma. You can hit that link and you can sign up. I don't know if they, they'll let me put it. Yeah, there you go. Speaker.com slash the sports coma. That is the link where you guys can follow the sports coma audio podcast we do throughout the week. We also have other bot. We have boxing shows. If you're a boxing person, if you like boxing, sign up for it. Join our YouTube page for the boxing world um, to follow the boxing information. The audio podcast box uh bring Kings boxing world is there also. There's other shows and content. You can go all the way back and listen to old shows, prior shows from the Sports Coma. Um, and also the Pelican Post Game Report, that content is there. And it's, it's, it's several shows there from the Sports Coma that span back at least 50 shows, I want to say, at least 30, 40 shows. So you can listen to all the – if you missed the Sports Coma audio podcast, you didn't catch it last week or the week after that, you can feel free to catch it. And always be on top of it there. And also you can interact with us on our audio podcast as well, like you do here now on the live stream. So uh, you can feel free to do that. If you haven't uh, or if you aren't a subscriber, I ask you to hit the subscribe button today. Hit the notification button for future content and also hit the like button uh, to get more people to join the live stream. So i like to thank all of you terrific Sports Coma families for joining us. And uh, Lloyd, uh, Dada Saints fan, Chad Prue, Jason King. Um, let me see. I go down and make sure I get everybody here. Uh, give you guys all credit for joining us today, um, today on the show. Uh, who else do we have here that we that we didn't uh, chime in? I think I covered Faceway, um, Dayman, you know, just Eric Lionel, all just everybody, man. Thank you guys for joining us on the uh, live stream today. Remember, every Saturday at twelve o'clock noon, we'll put on the on the stream. It's supposed to be two hours, but you know, we almost went three hours today. Last Saturday, we was four hours. So when we talk in Saints and sports, man, we just let it we just let it go. You know what I'm saying? But we can do that. But thank you all all for joining us on a sports coma. As always, like I said, subscribe to the show. Join us. Even uh, we got social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the sports coma. You can Google it or go to the uh, section in our YouTube page that will have all the links where you can follow all the late, get all the latest uh, news from the Pelicans, Saints and boxing. If you enter that thing. You can join our social media as well. So thank you guys for joining us on the Sports Coma. From me and the crew here, thank you. Peace.